Evening came, Claire settled comfortably in her castle, preparing for dinner. But then Tom came and angrily attacked her with loud words that Samantha died because of her. The main character did not understand anything. What had happened? Why he was saying that? She asked Tom, not believing her ears, that he meant whether Samantha really died. Tom started screaming that it was all her husband, Brooks Lawrence, and he destroyed her entire Bronson family because of charges of treason, but the worst thing is that he killed her, Samantha, his own wife. Claire was amazed. She stared at one point in horror and said, What? The heroine burst into tears and plopped down on the floor, not understanding how Brooks could be so cruel. But suddenly Tom abruptly and rudely told her that she should have died instead of Samantha and reminded her that she had once refused her marriage to Brooks Lawrence. Claire, with tears in her eyes, told him that he was wrong, that she had always loved only him and wanted to be his wife, which is why she abandoned Brooks. The guy with deep regret told her that the place of the mistress of the Reacher family does not belong to her and, in general, why it should be her. And then he grabbed her tightly by the shoulders and began to shake her, shouting at her that this was not her place. The heroine was in great pain, her soul ached from the pain, and her shoulders were tightly squeezed by Tom. She asked him to stop, but he continued to shout at her that Samantha should have been standing in front of him now, not her. Fortunately, the maids arrived in time and Claire was torn from her husband's arms while Tom's assistant tried to calm his master. The hero, in a stupor, grabbed his assistant. There were tears in his eyes. He just sighed loudly and said Samantha's name. Claire cried nonstop. She suddenly realized that he only needed her, Samantha. She thought to herself that he wished she was here and she needed to die in her place. The heroine began to remember her half-sister, Samantha, the daughter of her stepmother. How smiling and beautiful she was. After all, even before her marriage to Tom Reacher, she suspected that he was not indifferent to her sister, but she always hoped that this was a fleeting feeling. Claire could not calm down. She cried and kept saying that if she had known that this would happen, she would have married Brooks Lawrence, and then Samantha would have remained alive. The maids prepared a hot bath for the heroine with rose petals and brought her a bottle of wine. Claire sat down in the bath and staring at a glass of wine, asked the maid where her husband Tom was now. The maid told her that he had gone to work and would be very late. She asked her to leave her alone and not let anyone in, took a glass of wine and thought about it. Holding the glass in her hand, she took a long time to decide to drink it because there was poison in it. She thought that she could leave this world without regrets because Tom already has another woman, very similar to her sister Samantha, and she will be able to console him. After taking a few sips, the main character lost consciousness and the glass fell from her hands and broke into pieces. Her last words were Tom, I will die just like you wanted. And suddenly it was dark. But the girl heard someone's voice. He asked her to wake up. She frantically opened her eyes and did not understand what was happening. Claire looked around and tried to understand what kind of place this was. Didn't she die? Because she drank poison? Or maybe she was found so quickly. A maid was sitting next to her and smilingly told her, Thank God you woke up, miss. But then Claire recognized her. It was Mia and asked her what she was doing here. And then it dawned on her that she was in her room, but she didn't understand how this was possible because nothing was left of the house seven years ago during a fire. A man came into the room and told her how glad he was that she had finally woken up. Claire's jaw dropped. She couldn't believe her eyes. After all, it was her father. He smiled at her and waited for her to come up to him to hug him. But the heroine was very surprised by these events because her dad died a long time ago. Four days passed, the weather was beautiful, the sun was shining very brightly. Claire was having breakfast in her room and still couldn't understand what could have happened. The girl got up and went to the mirror, looking at herself. She thought that she had returned to the past, that she had woken up in time when she was 22 years old. She walked around the room and thought, the Bronson family has not yet been destroyed. She has not yet married Tom and her sister is not yet married to Brooks Lawrence. The image of Brooks appeared in her head and she thought that this time she should do everything differently. The heroine accepts the offer to marry Brooks. He thanks her for giving him such an honor. But all she thinks about is that she will become Brooks's wife, not Tom's, that she will marry a man who will destroy her entire family and kill her herself. Claire has already accepted her fate. Since death awaits her, she will jump into the very center of events and try to live at least a little better. Bronson Mansion, Tom came to her during breakfast. She got up from the table and told him not to think that after the engagement was called off, 
they would now remain friends. The guy was silent. Claire said that she was no longer his fiancé, not his lover, and certainly not his friend. Tom was stunned. He looked into her eyes and asked what she meant, why she said that. The heroine just lowered her head and told him that he was now Samantha's fiancé and asked him to behave appropriately, at least for her sake. The guy remained silent. Claire seemed to be not at all upset. The first thing after returning to life, the main character broke off her engagement with Tom, and surprisingly, it was very simple, but such a trifle brought her so much suffering. They sat down at a table and Claire told him that she hoped that he would not come to her again for personal reasons. Tom couldn't believe it. He asked her why she decided that. But the main character was silent and looked at the guy with sadness. He slammed his fist on the table and angrily asked her if it was true that she agreed to marry Lawrence and asked what the reason was, did he really force her? Claire sighed heavily and said that this had nothing to do with Brooks. But Tom still didn't let up. He couldn't understand what the reason was because she didn't dream of this, but always wanted a real loving family and told her that you couldn't find happiness in a marriage of convenience. The girl looked sadly at the guy and told him that he knew what she was dreaming about, but still wanted her sister. Claire then plucked up her courage and told him that she didn't want to see him anymore and their relationship was over. But Tom didn't like it, he told her to think it over again, because a political marriage means that there will be no love, and he really doesn't want her to go through that. Claire only mockingly told him that love is not her priority now, and that she is not getting any younger. It is better to hurry up and get married, otherwise who will give her this love, really Tom? The guy couldn't answer. There was deathly silence in the room. The heroine thought that even if she had a hundred lives, she would not have married him. Finally, he broke the silence and asked for her hand, saying that he would break off his engagement to Samantha and they would get married. This shocked the heroine, and just as she wanted to tell him that he was crazy, then someone entered the room. It was Brooks Lawrence. He stood in the doorway and smiled. They turned to him and he said, what an awkward situation. Claire and Tom looked at him in surprise, and she could only say his name, not believing her eyes. But Tom decided to tell him how dare he come here. To this, Brooks only answered him with a smile that he had come here to visit his bride and was not going to ask his permission for such a thing. He presented the heroine with a beautiful bouquet of roses, to which she thanked him and told him that she was very surprised by his arrival and why he didn't even warn her. Brooks only sarcastically answered her that he himself was very surprised, because they had already agreed to be engaged, and he did not think that he needed her ex's permission to visit. Tom was very angry with him, but Brooks decided to drive him away with his magic and said goodbye to him, finally telling him that he and his fiancée had a lot to discuss. There was a bright flash. Everything in the room lit up, and with one wave of his hand, Brooks made Tom disappear. Claire was amazed and asked the groom where he had taken him and what had become of him. He laughed and told her not to worry because Tom is a skilled knight. He will return back without problems. He sent him to one picturesque place to cool down a little. The girl was impressed by his skills and asked the Marquis if it was a teleport and said that he was very good at magic. He said it was a simple spell and asked her to call him by his name, Brooks. After all, she calls her ex by his first name and him by his last name, and this upsets him very much. Claire told him that Tom was just a childhood friend, and that's all. Brooks told her to call him Sir Reacher, or Prince Reacher, and asked why her ex-fiancé had come to her. She told him that Tom felt responsible to her because of the cancellation of the engagement, and was afraid that I would suffer in a political marriage. Brooks asked her if it was not his fault. She said yes. He liked her sister, and that's why he broke off the engagement. The heroine kept wondering where Tom was now, what was wrong with him, how was he? At this time... Tom found himself in some kind of forest unfamiliar to him. It was very quiet, only from afar he could hear owls screaming and whistling. He walked along the path, not understanding where he was and cursing Lawrence. And then a huge green predator with large, sharp fangs crept up to him from behind and growled. Tom was frightened by surprise and slowly turned towards the predator, preparing his sword to plunge into it in case of attack. As soon as he turned, the beast growled and jumped at him, the hero managed to raise his sword and stabbed him right in the neck. Tom sat directly on the beast and opened the navigation artifact to find out his location. He carefully studied the map and realized that he was on the Devil's Mountain. The hero gritted his teeth and said the name of Brooks Lawrence. He remembered that this mountain had been declared forbidden by the royal family and that this place was a haven for monsters, where no human had set foot for four years. 
Three weeks later, Brooks Lawrence and Claire Bronson got married. It was a luxurious celebration. A lot of guests arrived. Claire was beaming. She looked very beautiful in that pink and white dress, she said to herself. Finally, finally she is marrying Lawrence. The maids hovered around the bride, correcting her hair and makeup, because the celebration was about to begin. Someone entered the room and asked if the bride was ready. Claire stood with her back turned and saw her stepmother. Her half-sister Samantha also came with her mother. The stepmother did not congratulate Claire, but only emphasized how much influence the Marquis of Lawrence had, that the proposal was only three weeks old, and such a magnificent wedding was already ready. But Samantha decided to congratulate her sister and told her that she wished her a happy marriage and long life. Claire thanked her and asked about her wedding to Tom, whether she was expected next year, and said that she was unlikely to be able to attend. Samantha told her that there was nothing terrible about it, that she would already have a lot to do and had no time to celebrate. After a short silence, Samantha asked her about Tom if he had contacted her. The girl was surprised that he had not yet returned from the mountains and told her sister that he had not contacted her. Samantha said that he sent her a message saying that he would stay for a while, but she didn't understand why he should train because it was very dangerous in those mountains. Claire responded with sympathy that she didn't know, so don't tell her that Brooks sent him there. The wedding celebration begins. Everything is decorated with flowers and colorful flags. Fireworks are set off. The bride approached the altar where the groom was waiting for her. The priest began to read a prayer. The bride and groom stood and listened to him. Here the priest asked the bride whether she swears love until death for the groom. Claire looked at her fiancé and he smiled back at her. She lowered her head and sighed softly. Then she looked at him again and said that she swears. The priest said that now the groom can kiss his bride. They said goodbye to the guests and sailed away on the ship to spend their honeymoon. In the evening, Claire sat on the deck in only a dress and sadly looked into the water. Then Brooks came up to her from behind and carefully threw his jacket over her. She thanked him for his concern. He told her that there was no need to thank him because she was now his wife and said that she was no longer Claire Bronson, but Madame Claire Lawrence. The girl became embarrassed and only shyly said that she was not used to it yet. She suddenly remembered that her ex-fiancé Tom never called her Madame Crawford, as if he didn't consider her his wife at all. He just called her Claire Bronson. Suddenly, Brooks asked her why she didn't become a duchess. The girl looked at him in surprise and said that this did not suit her, that she was not very good at small talk. He asked her what she was dreaming about then. After thinking a little, the girl replied that she wanted a loving family. After she saw her parents' marriage, in which there was not a drop of happiness. She also said that she always dreamed of marrying her loved one, starting a family, having children, and living a normal life. The guy listened to her and said that he knew how difficult it was for people in their position to achieve this. The heroine agreed with him, said that that's why she gave up, and her dreams no longer exist, but her heart is calmer and asked him what he dreams about. He thought for a while and said that he dreams of absolute power, so that no one will be an obstacle to him, and this goal is more important to him than thousands of lives. Claire froze in amazement, but it turned out that he was just joking and said that he wanted to enjoy family life. The girl smiled and reassured him, saying that his dream would soon come true. The heroine thought about her fiancé. Here he is Brooks Lawrence, who destroyed the Bronson family, one of the two great ducal families, being the illegitimate son of the past emperor, received the title of Archduke, and when his dream comes true, she will already be dead. Suddenly, Brooks asked her what she thought, if they had a good honeymoon. The girl did not answer, and he continued, putting his hand on his heart and telling her that even if he did not give love, he would cherish it as much as possible. She said that she believed him, that he would not give love, looked into his eyes, and they merged in a kiss. During the kiss, she thought to herself, and prayed that he wouldn't love her because she didn't want to trust anything unreliable anymore. Tom appeared outside the Bronson Duchy Palace with a sword in his hand, his clothes dirty and torn. People around him began to whisper about him, wondering what could have happened to him. As soon as he approached the palace, the guards came to him, telling him to get out of here quickly, to which the hero told him to tell him that Tom Crawford had returned. Meanwhile, rumors have already reached the Lawrence estate that Tom has returned. Mason Dawes, Brooks' longtime servant, confirmed this. Brooks said with annoyance that he returned quite quickly. He should have been thrown further away. He then ordered his servant to ensure that Claire did not find out about anything. The servant dared to notice that the master cared very much about Miss Claire. 
Brooks looked sternly at the servant and told him not to dare to speak like that again. Now she is his wife and also the mistress of this estate. Mason asked the owner for forgiveness, but again wanted to say something about Miss Clare. But Brooks scolded him and told him to mind his business. The servant left, leaving the master alone with thoughts of Tom Reacher. The next day, Brooks took Claire to his wonderful garden. The garden was simply magnificent, she was delighted. The guy looked at her and was proud that she was impressed. Then he asked if she liked this magnificent garden with flowers. The girl answered yes, she liked it, and said that the garden looked like a clearing with jewels. Brooks said he didn't think about the fact that she didn't like bright things. That was his mistake. He should have asked her opinion first. She objected, saying that yes, of course, the brightness of the roses was a little overwhelming, but she didn't hate them, and the gardener probably tried very hard. The guy laughed and said that this was just his little hobby, because with magic it was becoming easier. The heroine was surprised whether such a garden could be created with the help of magic. He told her that with the help of magic, you can do anything. Magic can make dreams come true, or attack someone. It all depends on the desire of the sorcerer. Claire was very impressed and listened to him further with interest. The guy then asked her if she wanted him to teach her magic. She was surprised and said that it was not worth teaching. She could not use it. The main character told how she tried to use magic for a long time as a child, and no matter how much money and time she spent on it, it was all to no avail. She has no talent. Claire looked at Brooks again and told him she didn't think she could learn. He told her that a person can never be sure what he is capable of, and she should not worry, because her teacher is the best magician in the world. The girl laughed and promised that she would think about his proposal. It was getting dark and the sky was shrouded in a fiery sunset, creating soft shades of orange, pink, and purple. Brooks led his wife into a luxurious, bright room with a large, soft bed and said it was her bedroom. She looked around the bedroom and saw a portal. Brooks told her that she could use it whenever she wanted since she was on the fourth floor. Claire was amazed that there was such a portal in the mansion and noticed how convenient it was, but he just laughed, asking what she expected from the magician's estate. When the girl approached the bed, she noticed that there was only one bed, and where was his bedroom, she asked. Brooks annoyedly asked her if she didn't want to room with him. She lowered her head and said that she didn't mind, but suddenly she remembered how she lived with Tom. They had separate rooms, and she always thought that this was normal. The guy asked her again if she didn't mind that they would sleep together in the same bed. She replied that she didn't mind. The heroine had sadness in her eyes. She understood that married couples sleep in the same bed, and this is quite normal. Afterwards, she decided to ask him about children, whether he wanted them soon, since she, of course, was not going to avoid marital responsibilities, but she did not want to rush with children yet. Brooks agreed with her that it was too early for that. Closing her eyes, she said that she would then take birth control pills, but the guy was against it. He said that there was no need for this. The pills have a side effect, and anyway, this is a political marriage, so there is no need to rush. Brooks told her to take care of her health first and avoid anything that could harm her. The girl was very impressed by these words. She could not believe it, but agreed with him and promised. The guy looked at her with some kind of longing, and his eyes filled with tears. Before Claire returned to the past when she died, Brooks was told about it. He was informed that she had died of a heart attack, and that shortly before her death, she had been using silver bell extract to lower her blood pressure. Brooks's faithful servant told the owner that the problem was with the birth control pills. The combination of drugs had a side effect. Brooks closed his eyes, did not want to believe it, and was thinking about it. But the servant continued, telling him that almost no one knew that she was very worried and he regretted this accident. The owner asked him again if he really thought it was an accident. It couldn't be an accident. Servant Mason did not understand what the owner wanted to say by this. Brooks said that before her marriage, Claire's mother's name was Annie Waldorf and she was from Dopes. And she died just the same, from a heart attack caused by a silver bell. Then Mason realized what he wanted to say by this, Claire Bronson decided to leave just like her mother. The hero took his jacket and headed towards the exit, and said that it was very lucky that she chose this particular method of suicide. We need to take her body. The servant asked him if he was sure that Tom would give her body up so easily. He turned to him and said that he would take her from there at any cost and left. Claire lay in a coffin strewn with white lilies. Tom stood next to her and cried, begging her to wake up and not leave him. Then Brooks appeared and told him that he always neglected her before. Why didn't he care about her so much before, when it wasn't too late? 
Brooks walked closer to the coffin with Tom and his servant sitting on his knees and said his name. Tom's anger flared and he took out his sword to stab him. Brooks also readied his sword and stood up to defend himself. Tom shouted that he was involved in the destruction of her family and ran up to him to plunge the sword into him. But he couldn't do it. Some kind of magic in the form of a shield protected Brooks, and there was a bright blue light in the room. Tom was furious. He couldn't believe what happened to the sword. The magician only told him with a smile that he would not leave here without her body. Tom still didn't let up. He told him not to talk nonsense, that Reacher's family would not stand aside and let him only dare to lay a finger on her. Brooks told him that it wouldn't matter, no matter what they did. He regretted what happened. He had no other choice. As soon as he snapped his fingers, the coffin rose into the air. Tom and the servants were afraid of what this sorcerer was doing. Tom turned to Brooks, screaming at him to let her go, that he couldn't dare take her from him. The magician turned to him and said that he should have thought about this earlier. A portal appeared in the room where Brooks directed the coffin and disappeared at the same moment. It is now past midnight, the moon is shining brightly, and its light is reflected in the room. Brooks and Claire sleep on the same bed with their backs to each other. But the girl is not sleeping. She can't fall asleep. She opens her eyes and wonders if her husband is sleeping now. She hasn't shared a bed with anyone before and can't take a deep breath because she's afraid he might hear. Claire kept thinking and remembering that in her past life she had never spent the night with Tom, even though they were lovers and even got married. As soon as she closed her eyes, Brooks looked at her and thought how hard it must be for her to fall asleep. Claire finally fell asleep, and Brooks decided to get out of bed and headed towards the door. Dungeon, someone called for help from the dungeon and groaned. There sat a man in chains, dirty, exhausted, and covered in blood. The door creaked. The man raised his head and had difficulty saying who was here. A man, apparently from a wealthy family with patent black shoes, entered the dungeon and asked Count Engels if he remembered him. The man immediately recognized him. As soon as he looked into his face, he said in surprise that it was him, Prince Brooks himself. The guy mockingly told him, it's so difficult to call an illegitimate child a prince. Then the guy introduced himself to the man and said that he was Brooks Lawrence. The man couldn't believe it. Was it really true he was a marquis? Brooks said that being a commoner from birth, he tried to curry favor, quickly gained fame, and received the title of Marquis. That's how Brooks Lawrence became what he is today. The man refused to believe this and told him that this was absurd because the prince had once sold him into slavery. The guy confirmed his words and added that the man who bought it was called Waldorf. The man could not believe that it was Waldorf, and at that moment someone entered the dungeon and stood at the threshold. The prisoner looked at the man who was standing at the door. Brooks asked him if he had probably heard about them, because the head of the clan can control the whole world with three fingers, and he holds 35% of the underground capital in his hands. And this is his representative, Mason, Brooks said, pointing to the guy. The man lowered his head in annoyance and asked if it was true that the Waldorfs were involved in this. Brooks told him the situation he was in now. The man began to deny and said that he knew nothing, and the Bronsons were to blame for everything. The hero laughed back at him and said, since he says that he knows nothing, from whom did the Empress receive information about the illegitimate child, perhaps also from the Bronsons? The prisoner did not know what to answer him, and then Brooks abruptly grabbed him by the hair and threatened him that his patience was running out and that he should not waste his time. The hero continued to hold him by the hair, raised his head and told him straight to his face that since she secretly supported the second prince, the first prince and the Bronsons decided to do everything quietly. But then she found out about the illegitimate child and who told her about this, Brooks asked him. The man was silent, then Brooks asked him where Catherine was. He turned his head away, closed his eyes and said that she was dead. And the hero got angry and hit the prisoner in the face with his fist. The man, choking on blood, told him that he just wanted to destroy Lorraine out of jealousy. So he told the Empress, and if they kill him now they will never know where Catherine is. Brooks angrily told him to be more respectful and not to call his mother that. The prisoner began to desperately shout that he did not deserve such abuse and asked Brooks whether he could have reached his current position if he had not sold him to the Waldorfs. The guy was silent, but the man continued, told him that he was now a Marquise, but he could spend his whole life in the shadows and wouldn't it be better not to stick his head out once again if he acquired such a status? then why is he behaving so vilely?
Brooks asked him with a smile what was good about the title of Marquis, since that was not enough for him. The man looked at him questioningly, and he told him that he had been looked down upon all the time. Now he wants to repay the debt and become a duke. And he added that this is not even the final goal. With such a title, he will be able to enter the fight for the throne, and everything can work out for him if there are no direct descendants left. The prisoner indignantly shouted at him that he was completely crazy, this was treason. And Brooks told him that this was just the legal order of succession to the throne. Servant Mason handed the sword to his master. Brooks took the sword and put it to the prisoner's throat and told him that he was giving him one last chance. He asked him again where that traitor David was now. The prisoner was silent and then Brooks cut his throat slightly, but the blood immediately began to flow. And then the man spoke, told the Marquis that he was now in Albra, boarded a ship and headed to the port of Porcendo and added that this is all he knows. Brooks gave the sword to Mason and ordered him to kill the prisoner. The man tried to stop him, but the Marquis had already left. The servant went into the master's room and told him that he had killed the prisoner and said that he thought that the master himself would kill him. Brooks said he hates the smell of blood, and his wife has an equally keen sense of smell. Mason asked the master if it was true that he was going to take the throne. The hero replied that he was not sure yet. All his life he had only tried to become better than others, in the hope that this would at least fill his heart a little. Mason asked what the master would do if this did not happen. He asked him what would change if he took the throne. Brooks went to the window and said that he would become the head of Waldorf because he wanted it. But no one in this empire shared his opinion. Whether he became an emperor or a tyrant, he would still be overthrown. The servant turned to the master. Brooks looked at him and said that he was not destined to find happiness. Nothing would really change if he became a ruler. But he was not going to do anything. Otherwise, no one would even notice that he existed. Mason asked him if it would have been better for him if Waldorf had not saved him. Brooks answered no. If it weren't for him, he would have been sold to some pervert and would have died. He has no other way. Only a promise to Chloe that he holds on to. Then the gentleman suddenly decided to ask the servant about information about Tom Reacher. Mason said that the dukedom originally belonged to his mother, Charlotte Reacher. After her death, the title passed to her husband. Tom was then four years old. Mason handed over the papers with the information to the gentleman, who began to study them carefully and said that he did not know everything about it. Brooks read and saw the photo. Tom Reacher has a younger brother. Now he is 18 years old and he's also not deprived of talent, so he can become an heir. The servant asked the master if he was thinking about changing the head of the Reacher family. He replied that he was thinking about it. While looking through the papers, he suddenly saw a photograph of a girl who looked very much like his wife, Claire. Mason said that this woman is Tom's mother. She is the previous duchess and asked the gentleman if he noticed that she looked like Miss Claire. The gentleman objected, saying that his wife was a hundred times more beautiful. Brooks, looking at the photograph, thought about Claire and realized that now it became clear to him why Tom Reacher was so attached to her. Gallibal musician plays the piano. All the guests of the evening gathered in beautiful and bright outfits. But among them, little Claire stands sadly, dressed in a simple gray dress. Someone called her. She turned around and saw Tom. He approached her and apologized for being late. Claire asked him if her dress looked strange. It was the one he chose. Tom said she looked very nice and modest clothes suited her well. The girl did not answer anything. She looked around and it seemed to her that all the people were whispering and laughing at her. She thought that, despite the fact that everyone was wearing fashionable dresses, she wanted to wear something simpler. She was embarrassed by the extra attention. But suddenly the guy said that his mother liked such dresses because his family is a knight, so he hates frilly clothes and, and paying so much attention to appearance is a stupid idea. Claire told him that liking beautiful things is not something bad. Tom told her that she was beautiful, even in simple clothes. The girl blushed with embarrassment. The guy smiled at her, saying that it was true. And he suddenly asked if she could promise him that in the future she would wear only such things. She looked at him in surprise, and he added that she should not wear chic dresses. Everything simple suits her better. Claire wanted to say something in response, but she couldn't. She just thought that she didn't hate luxury. She just didn't want unnecessary attention. Tom told her that she was even more beautiful and asked about the promise. And the girl promised him that she would not wear chic outfits in the future. He was very happy about her promise. And then everything around became not so bright, as if a cloud was hanging over her head. Tom looked at her angrily and said that she had broken her promise. 
Claire didn't understand what was happening, what he meant. Tom grabbed her by the throat and began to choke her. The boy was no longer standing in front of her. It was already an adult and strong Tom. He was strangling her and asking why she married Lawrence and said that luxury did not suit her. Claire's tears flowed. She could not stop Tom. He did not listen to her, but only continued, saying that she promised and did not keep her word because he told her to wear only simple things. He continued to choke and scream at her, said he only loved Samantha, but married Claire because of her stubbornness, and now she dared to leave him and marry someone else. His voice echoed through the room. He told her that she couldn't do this and he promised to make her miserable. Suddenly, he suddenly changed his voice and began shouting to her, Come back, come back to me. And she shouted back at him, I don't want, I don't want. And then she woke up, opened her eyes and realized that it was a dream. Brooks sat nearby and asked if she was awake. She stood up and began to remember the dream. He asked what she had dreamed. It wasn't a nightmare by chance and apologized to her for not waking her up earlier. He put his hand on her shoulder. She replied that everything was fine. Suddenly, Brooks hugged her. Claire was very surprised and didn't know what to do. The guy continued to hug her and said that if she was against it, she could just push him away. But Claire did not push him away, but only silently smiled. Then she decided to tell him about the dream. She said that Tom appeared in the dream, and he tried to strangle her and asked why she didn't keep her promise. Everything looked so natural that she was scared. Brooks listened to her and said that she would have to do the same with him when they met. Claire objected, saying that it was just a nightmare. But the guy replied that although it was a dream, she was hurt, and Tom committed a crime. Since the law does not provide for punishment for sleeping, Brooks said, he would do it. But the girl interrupted him, asking that he was probably joking, and he replied that maybe he was joking. Brooks poured some hot tea and offered it to Claire, telling her it would help calm her down. She thanked him and again remembered that terrible nightmare dream. But she felt much better, and it was all thanks to Brooks, she thought. Claire finished her tea and she went to the window where he stood, and together they looked at the starry sky. The girl suddenly asked him not to destroy the rose garden. Brooks looked at her in surprise and said he thought she didn't like the garden. She smiled at him and said that she would try to love them. The girl thought about those beautiful roses in the garden and remembered Tom's words. He said that only modest things were suitable for her. That's why she refused everything sophisticated, but she might also like elaborate things. Claire told Brooks that she avoided these things because she wasn't used to it. He told her that she shouldn't listen to that guy. That's right, Claire thought, and again remembered the dream and her past. Yes, she once promised Tom that she would not like anything luxurious and dress like that. But what's the point of keeping your word if he didn't keep it first? Tom was left alone having lost that little Claire in a simple dress. Tom Reacher arrived at the Bronson mansion. He was joyfully greeted by Samantha. She told him that they had not seen each other for a long time. Has it really been a long time? Tom asked her and came closer to her. He noticed that her dress was very similar to Claire's. It was the first time Tom had seen her in such an outfit. Tom thought about it and remembered his ex-girlfriend and came to the conclusion that Claire was more suited to this. Suddenly, Samantha asked him why he came. Maybe he wanted to see her sister. No, said Tom, and closing his eyes, continued that he could no longer think about the fate of a man who foolishly married someone whom he had not known for a month. The guy told Samantha that he came for another reason and offered to cancel the engagement. She couldn't believe it and asked why. He said that his head had been a mess lately and he needed to train more. Samantha had to say that she understood him. Tom had already started to leave but turned to look at her. And she said that they had nowhere to rush. It was not urgent anyway. That's right, Tom agreed and said that he was a little busy today, so he was already leaving. But suddenly, Samantha grabbed his hand and tried to stop him and asked him to wait. She said that her mother would be back soon and asked him if he would like to meet her before leaving. Tom apologized and said that he had urgent business, so he could not stay. He put his hand on her shoulder and kissed her cheek goodbye. Samantha froze and said nothing. And Tom left and the girl just waved goodbye to him. As soon as he left the room, her face contorted in anger. She began to cry, wiping her tears. She began to say that she would not even look at this trash if he were not from the Reacher family. But suddenly someone came in and sternly shouted at Samantha. It was her mother. She looked angrily at her daughter. She was very unhappy with what she heard. Mother told Samantha to come to her chambers. They needed to have a serious talk. Okay, mother, the girl answered sadly. Lawrence Mansion, the day has come, and it is beautiful sunny weather outside. 
The main character opened her eyes and saw that a maid was standing near the bed, and she asked the mistress how she slept and how her trip was. The heroine stood up and saw her longtime faithful maid Mia and was glad that she had transferred here. Mia smiled and said that she had been promised a double salary, and the lady laughed in response. Opening the curtains, the maid asked the lady if she would like to have breakfast in the garden, as Mr. Lawrence ordered. Claire wondered if having breakfast in the garden would make the flowers smell too strong. The maid looked out the window and said that they would have to cook something simple, and added that the weather was so beautiful outside. How about admiring the view, Mrs. Mia asked. Claire thought about it. She now decided to try such things. The girl decided to do as Brooke said and agreed to go to the garden to have breakfast. The garden was simply charming. There were red, pink, and even blue roses growing in it, butterflies flying everywhere, and in the middle of the garden there was a decorated table with various dishes and snacks. Claire couldn't take her eyes off all this beauty. She then turned to Brooks and said she thought there would be a strong smell, but didn't smell anything. This is magic, the guy answered with a smile, and then she asked if this was possible. Brooks looked at her and said it would be easier to answer, which was impossible for him. The girl noticed that she was being modest, and the guy laughed and said how smart she was. For breakfast, they brought her a sandwich decorated with flowers and leaves. Claire stared at the plate and asked Brooks what kind of sandwich it was. The presentation was a little strange. Brooks said with a smile that it was a beautiful, fancy sandwich, just as she had said yesterday, and he tried to decorate it. You made it yourself, Claire asked him and decided to try a piece. As soon as she tried it, she realized how tasty it was and told Brooks that he was a great cook. The hero laughed and said thank you for the compliment, but the chef was cooking and he just decorated it. Claire made a stern face and said that she would then take her words back. Brooks was moved by this. The girl finished her sandwich, drank tea, and enjoyed the beautiful view. Suddenly, Brooks asked her what she thought about learning magic. The heroine hesitated and replied that she wouldn't say that she's not interested. She just lacks confidence, because there's nothing she's good at. Will she succeed? Brooks told her that if she was interested, then let her challenge her, and it didn't have to be magic. She could choose horse riding, drawing, dancing, whatever. And Claire, having listened to him and thought it over, agreed. Then he got up from the table and told her that they could try it now. How is it now? Claire asked, but the guy told her to listen to him carefully. Brooks started with a short introduction, saying that every person has their own attribute, and it is based on talent, people have the ability to move objects like water, and that the Earth is a magical molecule. When he finished, he asked Claire if she understood everything. She was a little confused, and said that her confidence had disappeared somewhere, and asked her to abandon the idea. The guy just laughed and said that he was asking for forgiveness. He deliberately complicated everything, because she is very sweet when she is confused. Let's keep it simple, Brooks said. You need something more than talent. The trick is to transform the image into form. Brooks raised his hand, and a glow appeared, followed by various blue and white figures. Claire looked in surprise at the magic that was now happening. But the guy said that he would show another way. It is more like creating a template that transforms the form. This is often called fortitude. Strength of spirit, the girl repeated, looking at him with fascination. It's not difficult to control, Brooks continued, if you have at least a little imagination. But certain emotions are needed to release it. Then he took an artifact similar to a pocket watch from the box. What emotions are needed, Claire asked. He replied that these must be strong and negative emotions. It is much more difficult for happy people. Try it once, Brooks said and handed her the watch. Claire stretched out her hands and touched the clock. The hands began to move at breakneck speed. She looked at the guy and asked him if he thought she would succeed. Everyone has their problems, said Brooks. The girl whispered her problems and having decided again, touched her watch. A small bright flash appeared. The guy noticed what a strong reaction was happening to Mana. That's a good sign, Brooks said, and decided to add some of his own. He touched Claire's hand and took the Mana in his hands. The flash became even brighter. Suddenly, the girl felt something and told Brooks about it and asked if this was the special feeling he was talking about. Suddenly, some kind of matter consisting of water was formed. Claire was delighted and shouted that it worked. Yes, Brooks said. This is the spirit of water. I didn't think it would work out so easily. Then he told her to imagine some form, a tree, a person, anything concrete. Otherwise, he would soon disappear. The girl frantically began to remember what she could imagine associated with the lake, the sea and remembered the dolphin. Immediately, the matter turned into a dolphin and seemed to jump out of the water. 
Claire succeeded and then Brooks told her to come up with a name for him. She thought for a long time what to name this dolphin and the name Vodin came to her mind. As soon as she said the name out loud, the dolphin jumped and spun around and became even clearer than before. Claire looked at him with admiration. When he suddenly disappeared into thin air, Brooks told Claire that he would appear when she called his name. He congratulated her and praised her, saying that it was a great honor to meet a spirit for the first time. But suddenly, the girl felt bad and began to lose consciousness. The hero was very scared for Claire and hugged her so that she wouldn't fall. The girl thanked him for his concern, and Brooks said that calling the spirit consumes a lot of energy and it is better to rest, and volunteered to accompany her. Claire smiled at him and said that she could go herself or just call the servants. Brooks objected, saying how he could entrust his wife to a servant and how could he be jealous. Hold on tight, the guy said and carried her in his arms. The heroine became embarrassed and ordered him to let her go. He smiled at her and said that he would never get tired of admiring her embarrassed face. While they were walking, she said that he had very strange hobbies and asked that because of his character, no one wanted to meet him before her. He only answered that maybe. Brooks thought about the spirit that Claire had summoned and pondered. Calling the spirit requires a certain clear emotion. Fire is fear. Wind is rage. Earth means loneliness. And water is what prevails in Claire is despair. Brooks sat in his office building a house of cards. Then his assistant Will came to him and reminded him of his wife Claire's birthday, that it was in January, and the master had not ordered the gift. Brooks didn't seem to be listening to him. He was thinking about something and holding his finger at the very top of the house. You haven't forgotten about him, Will asked, and then the hero destroys the house of cards. The assistant asked the gentleman if he had told her about his birthday. He replied that she did not need to worry about it. Others still sent him a lot of gifts. But then Brooks said that wasn't the problem right now and asked Will what he thought about his relationship with Claire. The assistant, after thinking for a while, said that the gentleman had become sentimental and even a little crazy. And he added that he became a man madly in love with his wife. Brooks thought about how he had become so loving. Will said that the wedding has already taken place and he no longer needs to pretend. And not what the lady will think. If he continues to take care of her like this, she might feel special. The gentleman asked the deputy if he was telling Brooks to become more level-headed. The hero began to think if he unexpectedly changed his attitude. How she would react. First she would be surprised. Then she would shut her heart. And he will simply fulfill the duties of the Marquise and their relationship will never become the same as it is now. They will have a bland married life and will only say hello and goodbye. And if Claire becomes like this, she will never call him by name or smile at him again. No, Brooke suddenly said and got up from the table. The assistant asked the gentleman what he had decided. The hero went to the window and said that he had never met anyone with such a gentle character. Claire was walking in the garden with the maids, and Brooks watched her and said how she was stingy with emotions, and that made her seem a little cruel. But he constantly sees the despair that she hides so much. And every time he has obsessive thoughts about grabbing her and hugging her tightly and kissing her. That's not like me at all, Brooks said. The assistant agreed with him and said it was surprising that the same devil of the battlefield was even capable of such a thing, because his allies fell into horror at his very sight. Brooks looked sternly at Will and asked if he often slandered him like that, and the assistant was a little scared of his own words and apologized to him. Will then proceeded to tell his owner that he knows he doesn't want to admit it, but he better stop running away because he's looked in love for a long time now. At this time, Claire returned to her room and trained with the spirit Vodin. She ordered him to put out the candle and Vodin, spinning around, did it in one second. The girl praised him and the spirit evaporated into thin air. She sat down on the sofa and felt her strength running out and noticed that even a short call to the spirit took so much strength. Claire thought about Brooks's words, how he said that it takes a lot of concentration and endurance, but this is her limit for now. Lost in thought, she suddenly remembered that he had never told her what feeling was required to call Vodin. She thought about Brooks, how the first time he gave her a completely different impression, the one who should kill her. Before returning to the past, Tom stood and watched as Brooks and the coffin in which Claire lay disappeared. Grand Duke Brooks Lawrence took Claire's body. Tom shouted and said that he must find it, no matter what the cost. The guards approached the gentleman and told him that they would catch him. Brooks headed to Devil's Mountain. But Tom ordered the guards that the soldiers of the second level and below would remain here in the castle, and the special forces of the first level would go with him. On Devil's Mountain, 
Brooks stood over the coffin and cast a spell, and magic runes began to appear around him. He was casting a spell when the servant mason standing next to him told him that this was impossible. There was no way to return to the past. But Brooks didn't listen to him and said that he promised Chloe and that he shouldn't even try to stop him. The servant objected, saying that the promise was thrown in as a joke, and Claire's mother was just a distant relative of Mrs. Chloe, and they had not even met. How could this promise concern someone with whom they simply shared the same blood? Brooks told him to keep quiet if he didn't understand how Claire was committed to her promise. This is too much of a sacrifice, Mason said with annoyance. Then Mr. Will's assistant came into their cave, watching them. He thought how Mason didn't understand him. As soon as Mason tried to stop the master again, Will intervened in the conversation and said that his promise said that if she chose her own path, then she should not interfere with this. Brooks turned to him and asked what he was doing there. Will replied that he didn't come to stop him because he wouldn't listen to him anyway. The deputy said he came to report that Tom Reacher had begun to act. Then he continued that it wouldn't be a problem if you turned back time, but it was a mistake to not cover your tracks. Servant Mason began to beg the master on his knees to immediately stop and not rush into deciding whether he really wanted to give up everything he had achieved in ten years. Who knows, Brooks said. In the beginning he was angry because of the failures, but starting over isn't so bad. The master told the servant that he knows how devoted he is to Chloe, because she once saved him from slavery, and this is probably the reason why he helps him, the successor. And he added that even Chloe Valverde did not know that their promise was a magical contract, in which he would not let Claire meet such a terrible end. How could you act so recklessly? Mason asked him, because breaking the contract means death. But I didn't die, Brooks said. There is a way back. That's why he's still alive, and if it weren't for him, this situation wouldn't even have arisen. He continued by saying that he felt no sense of satisfaction after becoming either a marquis or a duke, a void that even gaining the throne could not fill. So it's better to stop there, Brooks said, and continued to conjure with the time portal. Will said goodbye to the master, telling him that they would soon see each other in the past. As soon as the red flash began to appear, the guards arrived with Tom. Brooks sat closer to Claire and looked at Tom, who shouted at the guards to stop him immediately. But it was too late. Tom was already approaching the coffin, when everything lit up with a bright flame, a flash, and they disappeared. And just like that, the clock hands turned back. Brooks Chase, a child born under a witch's moon on the day of the most powerful magic in the year 1000. The child of the witch's day is usually weak and dies quickly, but this boy was different from others. A real demon was born among people. Even the curse of the witch moon does not matter to him. He brought with him a powerful, fateful, and dangerous force. There is no one in the world who could threaten his life. Brooks thought how he didn't have the strength left for a second return to the past. Even if everything went well, he wouldn't have any memory of it. Even though the spell was his, the memory will remain with Claire, as will the choice of which path to take when she returns. Present day, Claire and Brooks are having breakfast, and he asks her about the tea party, what she said. Yes, there is a party today, the heroine said. The girl said she wanted to try it since it was free. The event was organized by Viscountess Leona Woods. Brooks said the Woods family is small and neither aristocrats nor commoners. That's how Claire answered, and added that she had received many invitations, but she did not know where to go, so she decided that a tea party would be quite suitable. The hero agreed with her and asked her if she always dresses like this. The girl was surprised by his question and asked if she really looked strange. No, Brooks said with a smile, adding a little pizza as wouldn't hurt. And as soon as he snapped his fingers, her image began to change as if by magic. Lo and behold, her dress became so beautiful and luxurious the heroine gasped in amazement. Now Brooks said the final touch and conjured a huge and chic necklace for her. He looked at her in amazement and said that she was still beautiful, but now she was also stunning. It suited her very well. You are so talented, Claire said and asked if he liked this style. The guy replied that this one was better than the previous one and smiled at her. Brooks extended his hand to her and told her that he had business at the palace and would take her to Christopher Woods on the way. Claire looked at him questioningly and he said, Let's show people how close we are. This will be our first time going out together. She agreed and extended her hand, saying that this was one of her duties as a marquise. Not only because of this, Brooks said, but she didn't hear and when she asked again he said nothing. Let's go. They arrived at Christopher Wood's castle. Claire was greeted by two girls, Leona Woods and Charlotte Spring. My God, come in, Lady Bronson, said Charlotte. 
Claire looked at her and she replied, or you should be called Lady Lawrence. The heroine said that she did not think that she would meet Charlotte here. She replied that she was here on business and also did not think that she would see her. You look gorgeous today, said Charlotte. Before marriage, you dress like a widow. Where did such changes come from? Claire was puzzled, but that girl did not let up and said, has your rich husband really changed you that much? Two more girls approached them, and then Charlotte said that she was just joking because the Bronson family never had to complain about finances, and she laughed. The main character thought to herself that if she had known that Charlotte would be here, she would not have come. Charlotte Spring, a prominent member of the conservative faction, was declared heir to the Marquis of Spring. Claire doesn't understand why she's been targeting her ever since, or if it's because she's from a ducal family and Charlotte despises her for her lack of talent. They entered the hall where there was a table with various desserts. It's wonderful to see you in good health. Emily Smith greeted the heroine and said that she was worried because there were unflattering rumors. Claire wondered what rumors she was talking about. Betty Banks intervened and asked if she didn't know that Marquis Lawrence had never had relationships with girls, and Emily continued by saying that there were a lot of people here who'd been rejected by him. Charlotte then said that everyone was talking about how the Marquis was very close to his assistant, Will. She had heard that they had always lived together and stayed close. What a shame, one of the girls said and started whispering to each other. Claire said if they wanted to say that Brooks Lawrence prefers men. We are only discussing rumors, said Charlotte, and he would hardly have gotten married if it were true. She continued by saying that Claire Bronson chose him over Tom Reacher. Although he might take a lover, Charlotte said, and everyone laughed. Claire pretended that she was not offended by Charlotte's words. Then the girl turned to Claire and said that she had exaggerated a little and asked if she would tell all this to her husband. Miss Sring is just joking, said one of the girls. Claire looked at them and thought that of course she would tell everything to her husband. Then she decided to tell them that they were making fun of the Marquis and this was more like an invasion of privacy, so perhaps it makes sense to sue. Charlotte got angry and got up from the table. Claire looked at her and thought how she usually controlled herself before, but today she crossed the line. Maybe it was because he was of noble birth. Charlotte began to shout that she had only told rumors, and what was he even counting on even if he had never kissed the girl? The heroine looked at her and said that she should know when to stop, then added that she was leaving here. She had nothing more to discuss with them. As Claire stood up and began to walk away, Charlotte shouted to her that the Spring family would not be afraid of a commoner aristocrat. The heroine turned to her and asked if her father was as brave as her. Charlotte was furious, but Emily interrupted them and said wouldn't they become enemies if they sued. Claire just looked at them silently. And then Emily takes a cup of hot tea saying you forgot something, take the tea with you, and splashes it right in Claire's face. The girl closes her eyes and something unexpected happens, tea spills on Charlotte. Everyone looks at Charlotte in horror. The main character opens her eyes and does not understand anything. And then her spirit Vaudan appears. She smiles at him and thanks him for his help. The girls help Charlotte dry off and she looks at Claire with hatred. Then she tearfully says that Marquis Lawrence apparently protects his bride so much that he even gave her an artifact. Apparently the tea was not intended for me, Claire said and thought about Charlotte's words, an artifact. She was talking about Vodin. She took it for the effect of an artifact. It seems perfume is a rare phenomenon. Charlotte angrily said that she wouldn't leave it that easily. Claire told her that she would also remember how Charlotte treated her. They looked at each other with hatred. Charlotte then turned around and shouted to her friends that they were leaving. Leona Woods was horrified by what was happening at her tea party. I'll go too, Claire said to Leon and thanked her. She replied to take care of herself and ordered her to accompany the Marquise home. The servant and two servants of the castle stood and waited for the Marquise. The servant asked to follow him. One of the attendants glanced at Claire and watched her closely. When she had already left and was about to leave, she was stopped. It was the castle servant who was looking at her. He caught up with them out of breath and asked them to wait a little. Apologizing to her, he introduced himself as Ellis Engels. The servant who was seeing the lady off suddenly said what was wrong with this guy, and Ellis replied that in fact she was a girl. The servant suddenly thought that she looked more like a guy. Claire said she was glad to meet her and asked what she wanted. Ellis asked her if she had just used magic. She had just been interested in it since childhood. She asked the lady to stay and talk to her for a while. Claire invited her home to show her more. The girl, as usual, sat down on the sofa, opened her hand and said the name Voden, and he immediately appeared. 
Ellis looked with delight at the magic that was now happening before her eyes. This is Voden, the spirit of water, said the heroine. Ellis was very happy to see the water spirit for the first time. Claire continued that now his maximum is to put out the candles. What about protection from tea? Ellis suddenly asked, and Claire definitely agreed. They sat and watched as Vodan circled above their heads. I don't know how to make it stronger, said Claire. They say they are capable of even high-level magic, and they don't grow without a reason. Ellis, after thinking a little, invited her to participate in a hunting competition in February. The Ramon Forest would be opened by the royal family. The heroine, surprised by the proposal, said that she was not a knight and had never done such a thing. Ellis laughed and said that you don't have to be a knight. Everyone can participate. If you participate in the competition, she said, I will come every day and support you. Claire asked what about her personal time then. Ellis hastened to reassure the lady that she was a free knight, so there were no restrictions. She also said that she had an official status, but stupid rumors began to spread, and that's it. Claire asked what rumors, and Ellis said that because of her appearance she is popular with girls, they mistake her for a man. And when the truth is revealed, they disappear. Claire laughed at her crazy story. At this time, Mr. Brooks Lawrence had already arrived at the castle. He went into the hall and asked the servants if his wife had returned. One of the employees said that she returned ahead of time and not alone, but with a guest and now they are in the living room. Brooks hearing this turned to him and asked what other guest he was with. The servant described the guest as a handsome knight and added that he had not seen a uniform look so good on anyone for a long time. Brooks, heading to the living room, thought about the servant's words, handsome, looks good in uniform, and frowned. When he entered the living room, he saw the two of them sitting and talking about something. Brooks came up behind Claire, put his hand on her right shoulder, and said in her ear that it was not good to have an affair in front of everyone. The heroine did not expect that he would appear so suddenly. Brooks looked deeply into the eyes of the handsome knight. Claire told him that it was actually a girl, and she laughed. This always happens to me, she said, and they laughed together. She then stood up and said that her name was Ellis Engels, and that this was her first meeting with the Marquess. Hearing the name, Brooks remembered the prisoner Count Engels, who had recently been killed by his servant in prison. In the evening, Claire and Brooks sat, drank wine, and discussed the upcoming competition. She said the hunting convention was too much for her, but Brooks countered, saying the views of the Ramona Forest were spectacular and she wouldn't regret it. I thought you would be against it, said the heroine, because it's less than two months away. He smiled at her and said that he preferred rabbits and squirrels. And he added that in return he would prepare a scarf for her. She looked at him in surprise. Claire finally replied that she wasn't sure she could catch anyone, but she would try. Then she decided to talk about the situation at the tea party, how she heard a nasty rumor about him, and maybe he should take action. What rumor Brooks asked her about, she said it was about his sexual orientation. There was an awkward silence, and Claire asked if he was angry. He closed his eyes and said he wasn't angry, just a little shocked. What did you answer them, Brooks asked her. She said you don't look like a gay, Claire suddenly blurted out. Brooks began to ask why she said that he was not similar. She replied that she would not say something that she was not sure of. The hero looked at her and said that he did not expect that she would believe such a thing. Then he took her by the chin and pulled her towards him and said, So I need to prove this to you and smiled at her. She tried to object to the guy, but didn't have time. The guy pulled the girl closer to him and kissed her passionately. They kissed for a long time. The hero hummed with pleasure. After the kiss, Claire blushed and told him why he did it. Brooks, touching his lips, asked her if she now understood what his orientation was. The girl closed her eyes and said that she already knew that he was not gay. And she added that it was not necessary to do this. Words would have been enough for her. Claire then told him not to force himself to prove anything to her. Brooks was upset by this and wondered who she took him for. No trust in him. He told her that he doesn't force himself. Even thinking about kissing Will makes him sick. And at that moment, Will comes in and hears everything. Will only managed to apologize to them, stuttering. Claire began to worry about Will, that he might have misunderstood something. Brooks and the girl were standing on the balcony, and she decided to ask what kind of relationship she had with Will, and the hero thought that she was making fun of him. The guy turned to the assistant and told him to stay out of his sight until he calmed down. And keep your mouth shut, Brooks told Will, who sat down on the floor and began to sob. Then, taking the folder in his hand, he told the assistant to act according to the plan, they should not be allowed to tell Claire such things about their relationship with him. 
Will asked about our relationship, looking up at the gentleman. Brooks got angry and told him to stop saying that or he was going to shoot himself. Let's deal with this, Brooks said, studying the papers where the Charlotte Spring case was. Even if it damages the reputation, this cannot be allowed to happen. After studying the papers, the gentleman asked Will why he came. The assistant handed him the papers and said that it was a report about Catherine. Will reported that they saw a woman with ashen hair similar to her in the port of Laredo. She was followed in several villages, but was missed in Abbeville. She looked like she returned to Solaris. Brooks asked if she had returned to this country and what she wanted, to lay low or change her identity. The hero continued to think that this is not the case, she's not that smart. Then he turned to his assistant and ordered him to send all scouts to Solaris so that they would find her and no one should find out the identity of the informant. And he asked if they had dealt with Count Engels. Will said that they disguised everything as a suicide. It would be impossible to identify him. There shouldn't be any problems. Brooks began to remember today's guest, Ellis, and wondered if there would be problems. The hero asked the assistant if he knew who came to the castle today. Yes, the assistant said. I know that Ellis Engels came. The Count cut off all ties with his children. Brooks asked Will what he thought about her. He replied that she accidentally attended the same event as the mistress, and it was all a childish admiration for magic. So she decided to get closer to Claire. The hero with a smile asked the assistant if he really thought it was a coincidence. Will said he had heard that Ellis had visited the woods before, so it seemed true Brooks said well and ordered him to provide the results within two days. Then, turning to Will, he asked if it was true that Ellis was a woman and not a man. True, the assistant said, and asked him why he was asking this. Brooks looked at him questioningly. Will began to say that he knows what a perfectionist mister is, but sometimes he goes too far. This is jealousy, and he even kissed her and said that he was afraid rumors would spread if someone noticed. What do you want to say, Lawrence asked him. The assistant asked the gentleman if he loved her. Brooks turned away and told him not to invent anything. I feel the same for her as I do for Dumbull. Everything will end when the time comes. Will smiled and said that he did not know that the gentleman wanted to kiss Dumbull. The hero looked angrily at the assistant, and he regretted what he had just said. The next day, Ellis Engels came to visit Claire again. The main character greeted her with a smile and thanked her for the visit. Ellis mutually thanked the girl for the invitation, and Claire politely told her to follow her into the living room. They sat down to drink tea, and Claire told her that she had decided to take part in the hunt, but was a little worried because she didn't know what to do and therefore would be glad to receive any advice from her. Ellis said that she liked to communicate with her and guessed that it would be useful, so she brought it. What did you bring? The girl asked her. She took out two large books and placed them on the table in front of the mistress. Ellis suggested starting with the basics and said that she took two of the most famous books on spiritual magic. The girl thanked her for the books and noticed how thick they were. Ellis said that she was very interested in magic, so no one would suspect anything and told the lady not to worry about the rumors. At his estate, the Duke of Alte sat on a stepladder and tended to the flowers in the garden by cutting the stems. Tom Reacher approached him and asked if his father had called him. The Duke asked about the engagement and said that he heard it was postponed. Yes, Tom said, it's all because of my training. The Duke raised his voice and told him not to make excuses about who drinks alcohol every day during training. What you were dissatisfied with, your father began to continue. You didn't even have competitors and asked why he changed his decision because he was worried about the refusal of the other. The Duke reminded him that he swore once, and he does not intend to wait long. He does not care about this family after the death of his mother. The Duke said that he wanted to quickly get rid of the position of head, and if Tom did not have the necessary qualities, then he would not get the job. And he added, looking into Tom's eyes, that he would never transfer the title to a useless person who could not even cope with the affairs of his own family. Do you understand me? The Duke asked Tom, and the guy answered. Afterwards, his father told him that he was giving him until April, and he should marry Samantha Bronson. No more delays. Tom objected, saying that it was his business. No, said the Duke. This is a matter for the entire Reacher family. If you fail, the title will go to your brother. Tom slammed his fist on the wall and became very angry. The butler passed by and asked if everything was all right with the young master. Tom said that he just had a headache. The guy said that he has been tormented by nightmares lately. He dreams of Claire and how Brooks takes her body. Lawrence Estate, Brooks introduces Claire to his servant Mason. 
They exchange pleasantries, Claire telling her husband that she thought only Will was helping the Marquis. Brooks responded that Mason was a little shy with strangers, so he decided to introduce them later. He then said that from that day on, Mason would teach her the basics of spiritual magic, including hunting tricks. And he added that Ellis need not waste any more of his time. Claire agreed and said that this was his estate and she should not have invited a guest without warning. The hero replied that this was not why he decided so. The girl stood in the middle of the room and called Vaudan and Mason watched everything. Mason said that Woden is still small. He is in the infancy stage. Usually, these spirits develop quickly. And he continued that his body was too small and when hunting, she would have to use tricks and not hit him in the forehead. What tricks Claire asked, he answered that, for example, you need to cover your head with water and suffocate or block your vision. There are quite a few effective methods. The girl said that it was very cruel, and Mason answered her that hunting is hunting. There's no way around it. Claire lowered her head, and Mason asked her if something was wrong. She replied that she had never hunted. The girl said that she needed to practice more. She continued to conjure with Voden, and Mason gave her advice to direct the energy to her fingertips and concentrate. Mason, looking at Claire, began to remember Miss Chloe, and he said to himself why she decided to take care of her. It seems you are a little distracted. Rest a little, Mason said. She looked at him with a smile and said, Okay. Suddenly, the servant decided to ask her if she knew Madame Chloe Waldorf. Claire was surprised and said that her mother's maiden name was Waldorf, before her marriage, her name was Angelina Waldorf. The servant listened to her carefully. She said that after getting married, she didn't really communicate with her family, so she hardly knew anyone. Mason thought that most likely Angelina Waldorf is Miss Chloe's cousin, and it turns out that if Claire is her daughter, then she is Chloe's fifth cousin. The servant thought so strangely, Miss Chloe hasn't even met Claire, what's her interest then? Claire asked the servant why he was interested, he replied that he thought how similar they were and apologized to his mistress. Then the servant suggested that she take a break and drink tea. After drinking tea, Claire said that she was very tired, and the servant said that calling the spirit requires a lot of energy, but her efforts paid off. She called Vaudan again, and to the heroine's surprise, he became even larger than before. Now you better rest and I'll go, Mason said. Claire thanked him for his help and sat down more comfortably. The girl began to fall asleep right on the sofa. She was very tired and thought to herself that she needed to go to her room. Suddenly, in her sleep, she felt her body as if being moved. Claire opened her eyes and saw Brooks carrying her into her room. He smiled and apologized to her, saying that he didn't want to wake her up, but simply move her to the room. Did you sleep well? Brooks asked her. She replied that he could have just woken her up. Brooks laughed and asked if she remembered what he said a couple of days ago about making his wishes come true. How about today, her hero asked with a smile. She looked at him pitifully. She said that she would need to pay for his help in studying and asked what he would ask for. Brooks replied that she could choose from several options. Two maids held dresses in their hands. One was simple, the other luxurious. Choose, Brooks told her, but the girl didn't know which dress she wanted. The hero decided to help and told her that Red looked gorgeous and asked if she agreed with it. The girl agreed with him and said that the second dress looked too simple. Brooks said with a smile that she used to like dresses like that, and he thinks her opinion has changed. And he added that he was very glad that she was used to such things. The girl settled on a red dress and tried it on. She looked at herself in the mirror and gasped in amazement, and thought that she looked good on her. Brooks couldn't take his eyes off his wife and said the dress suited her very well. The girl smiled at him and thanked him for the compliment. Then let's go, Brooks said, and taking her arm they went into the living room for dinner. There were two tables in the living room, and on them there were various dishes ranging from steak, mushroom soup, and salad to spaghetti bolognese. The girl looked at all these dishes in surprise and asked what she needed to choose a table. I choose this one, Claire said, and walked over to the white table. Brooks snapped his fingers and suddenly the table disappeared and she found herself behind the red table. The girl looked at what was happening in surprise, and the hero told her that she didn't have to choose. She asked him where the table had disappeared, was it really a teleport to the mountains again? Brooks told the girl that this was a servant's dining table and asked Dumbala to confirm his words. The heroine enjoyed every bite of food, and her husband watched her furtively. Do you like it? Brooks asked her. She agreed and said that today it tastes better than usual, very elegant. Suddenly, the hero said that the third time the conditions were the same, the hall of the estate or the citadel, he asked her. She said that this was some kind of meaningless question and asked what he was going to do. 
After thinking a little, the girl said that she was choosing the hall. As you wish, Brooks told her and bowed before her. The hero raised his hand above his head and a large portal immediately formed. In an instant, everything around changed and they moved into some kind of hall. Claire was again very surprised and amazed at how quickly they teleported. And then Brooks extended his hand to her and asked if he could ask her to dance. The girl did not know what to answer and said that she danced very poorly. It's okay, there's no need, the hero said. Just enjoy and follow my movements. Let's dance together. He said that if she didn't want to, she could refuse, but she said that everything was fine and asked him not to move too fast. It's an honor, Brooks said, and took her hand. The music began to slow down, and the girl thought that it must be his magic again. This is my first time dancing such a slow waltz, the girl said, and he answered her that this was a melody especially for her and asked if she liked it. She answered, of course, and smiled. Then she asked him if she could try another melody. He replied that he wanted to dance to this one. Just like in our first meeting, the guy suddenly said. Immediately after the revival, Claire canceled her engagement with Tom. She doesn't know why maybe she wanted to see the one who would kill her in the future. That's why she attended the ball in the Capitol. And there she met Brooks Lawrence for the first time. Their eyes met. The hero approached her and invited the girl to dance. Dance with me, holding out your hand to the heroine, Brooks said. Claire looked around at everyone. Everyone was dancing and having fun, and she agreed. They danced together and the guy told her that they had not met yet and introduced himself as Brooks Lawrence. The girl lowered her head and said sadly, I'm Claire Bronson, by the way, my favorite YouTube viewer. If you subscribe to my channel, you will be the best subscriber and viewer. Then she told him that he had chosen dance as a reward for his services to his majesty and she did not expect him to choose her. But you don't look surprised at all, Brooks said. Not at all, it was unexpected the heroine answered. The girl asked what Brooks wanted to talk to her about. He said he heard her break off her engagement to Sir Tom Reacher. The heroine only answered him that she liked Tom. That's what the Marquis asked her in the past. Brooks then asked her if she was always so sharp with her words. Claire didn't say anything and just turned away, and then he asked if she might not like it. The girl removed her hand and asked him why he asked her to dance to mock her. Then the heroine looked at him intently and said that she knew a lot, even more than he thought. Brooks did not understand what she wanted to say, and the girl simply turned away and said that the music had already ended. They bowed politely to each other. Claire immediately said that she needed to go, and Brooks just silently stared after her. When the girl left, he looked at his hand in puzzlement and thought about something. The heroine went out onto the balcony and sighed with relief. What was he thinking about? She said to herself. Then Tom came to her and asked if everything was okay with her. She turned to him, and he asked her what the Marquis was talking to her about. The girl answered nothing important and asked where Samantha is now. Tom replied that she was accompanied by Duke Reacher, and today Tom was Claire's partner. She looked at him and wanted to say something. Then she turned away and decided to say that he had better take care of his bride. The guy was surprised by her words and asked why she behaved this way. The heroine listened to him, he continued, saying that she suddenly drew a line between them and the termination of the engagement did not cancel their friendship. Claire finally said that things are different now, their relationship won't be the same as when she loved him. Listen to Claire, he said and grabbed her hand, but she pulled it away. And she told him not to touch her and to leave immediately until she called someone. Tom was just about to say something to her when someone walked in and they both turned around and saw him. It was the Marquise Lawrence he came in and asked with a grin if he had disturbed them. No, we're already done, Claire said, exhaling. Tom again wanted to say something to the girl when Brooks interrupted him and called him. He turned to him, and the Marquis said that the girl told him to leave, their conversation was over. Tom Reacher got angry and left them, slamming the door. I came on time, yes, I asked the girl Brooks Lawrence. That's right, she answered, and asked why he came to tell her something. The hero answered her that he just wanted to end their last conversation. He then said that she looked tired, so they would meet later and ask for forgiveness and bowed before her. When Brooks started to leave, the girl stopped him, and she asked him if he would propose to her. The hero looked at her and said that she could guess that he wanted to climb very high, and a wedding was just a way to achieve this. She said that she would not appear for the holiday soon, and if he intended to do something, it would be better now. If so, the hero said, and came closer to the heroine and asked if she agreed to marry him. The girl looked into his eyes. Brooks waited for her answer, and she decided to kiss him. He, in turn, did not expect this. Yes, I agree, Claire said and ran away. They continued to dance and twirl to this beautiful melody. The girl suddenly asked why he asked her to dance. 
Remember when the ball started, we made eye contact, Brooke said. Claire looked at him and recalled their first meeting. Claire suddenly thought, that's how he looked at her then too. Brooke said there was emptiness in her eyes and her face was expressionless, like a ceramic doll. And with a smile, he said that he then wanted to break this mask, only out of good intentions. The heroine looked at him with admiration and said that now it doesn't look like a mistake. They continued dancing, and she said that there were rumors that he wanted to invite his majesty to dance. By the way, my favorite YouTube viewer, if you subscribe to my channel, then you will be the best subscriber and viewer. There are so many different fables. I'll deal with them later, Brooke said with dissatisfaction, and she laughed in response. By the way, what about the last rumor his heroine asked? He replied that he had already filed a complaint. Besides, Brooke said and almost kissed his wife. And he continued that this is no longer so important, and the girl laughed. Claire laughed and said that she thought he would kiss her. He asked her what was seducing him. The heroine suddenly said that she had long remembered the look when he joked. Brooks thought about what it meant she was watching him. Ah, the melody is over, the girl said and raised her head. She looked at him with a smile and thought inside herself that it seemed to her that the melody would never stop. And then the hero told her that the next choice was the Rose Garden or the Secret Garden of the Empress and asked what she would choose. She looked at him and asked what he would do if he chose the Empress's garden. He said that they would sneak there, and if someone noticed them, he would erase his memory. The girl said that there was no need for this. She liked the rose garden. Then, Brooke said and snapped his fingers, and a portal immediately appeared above their heads. The hall instantly changed into a rose garden, where there was already a bottle of wine and two glasses. She looked at the garden with admiration and said that no matter how many times she saw it, she still would not get used to both the garden and magic. He smiled and said that she would gradually get used to it and invited her to the gazebo. They drank wine and enjoyed the evening. Brooke suddenly said that it was already midnight and looked at Claire mysteriously. She didn't understand anything. And suddenly he takes out a beautiful white rose with a beautiful bow and hands it to her. Brooke said happy birthday to Claire and gave her a rose. The girl just opened her mouth and could not say anything from surprise. Brooks continued and said he was very glad she was born and congratulated her again. The heroine accepted the rose and thanked him. Claire thought that she had never had such a wonderful birthday. Then she told him with a smile that now it was his turn to choose. The hero looked at her questioningly and she said, choose to kiss you or kiss yourself. He was a little taken aback by her words, but the girl laughed and said that she would choose herself. Brooks didn't have time to say anything before she kissed him. He hugged Claire tightly and kissed her back. The girl looked straight into his eyes and lowered her head to his chest. He hugged her and kissed her forehead. The guy thought about the fact that he seemed to have fallen in love just a little. The next day we are transported to the mansion of the Marquis of Spring. The Marquis of Spring tells Charlotte that the Marquis of Lawrence has sued several people for libel and insults, some of whom are already under investigation. You must understand your position so as not to get into trouble, said Mark with Spring. Charlotte didn't answer and just snorted in displeasure. He said he didn't care about what she had done in the past, but this time she had crossed the line and ordered her to apologize to Marcus Lawrence. The girl was indignant and began to shout that these were just minor accusations, and they were able to refute them. Let everyone think that we cannot resist him, said Mark with Spring. And with a smile on his face, he said that this was just for now. He continued, saying that thanks to him, the dream of becoming a ducal family will come true. It is never too late to kill. Charlotte asked him if they would get rid of him when he became useless. By the way, you noticed that at your request, I very quickly made a second part for you. I love you. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your kind message to me in the comments under this video. Marcus Spring said that even the emperor could not do anything. The girl calmed down and said that she would write something similar to a letter of apology. Marquis Spring suddenly told her to stop communicating with Emily Smith. Your relationship is nothing but pleasant, the Marquis continued, so you won't end up with problems. Charlotte angrily said that Emily was her friend and that he should not even think about touching her. She then threw the teacup and kicked it and it shattered. Marquis Spring told her to look for someone better if she needed friends. Do you want to ruin the future because of an ill-mannered dog, asked the Marquis. Charlotte became furious and asked if he was really threatening her, because only she could be the heir to the Spring family. The Marquis looked at her sternly and said that he was the head now and that she should understand this. The girl clenched her teeth in anger and whispered that she would do as he said. 
Lawrence Mansion, Claire's birthday, and she is presented with a gorgeous bouquet of flowers. She gladly accepted them and thanked them, then asked Ellis how she knew about her birthday. Ellis replied with a smile that she asked the butler, and remembered that the Bronson family once celebrated a birthday in the winter. That's right, Claire said and began to remember that it was Samantha's birthday, and the heroine has not received any congratulations since she was ten years old. Then Ellis told her with a smile that that's not all. Claire asked in surprise what else? And she also gave her a plush dolphin created by Alfred, perfume from Albress, and a custom-made birthday cake. Claire was absolutely delighted and looked at her gifts with such admiration. She began to thank Miss Ellis from the bottom of her heart because she had prepared so many gifts for her. Ellis replied that it was all little things and smiled at the lady. A few days ago, Claire asked Brooks not to refuse a visit from Ellis Engels. The guy replied that there were some controversial issues, but if you think about it like that, it might make her wary, so it would be safer. He then said that if she was up to something, it would be better to pretend to be friends and watch her, but not trust her. We still don't know what Brooks was going through with her. And Claire looked at the hero with alarm, and then said that she understood everything. The heroine looked at Ellis and thought to herself what was really on her mind. The girls went into the living room, where the table was already set. They drank tea with cake and pastries. Here the heroine called Voden to demonstrate her progress to Ellis. She was delighted with how he had grown. They watched him circle above them, and Ellis said he became as big as her dog. Do you have a dog? Claire asked with interest. Ellis replied that she had a retriever, and said that she could come visit her and look at her. Then she added that it would be time to practice on a living creature before the hunt. Claire said that she didn't want to choke the dog, and Ellis replied that that's not what she meant. By the way, my favorite YouTube viewer, if you subscribe to my channel, you will be the best subscriber and viewer. After thinking for a while, she said, Let's do this. The dog hates bathing, and you can help me with your abilities. Well, she asked her, and the girl agreed to it. At the Engels mansion, Vodin circled around Ellis's dog, and they played beautifully together. Vodan kept splashing with water with the dog, and she really liked this game. But when the dog got all wet, she sat down and howled. Claire looked at her and giggled. She would definitely have attacked me if it weren't for Vodin, the heroine said with a smile. And Ellis in response said that they had finally bathed Jessie. They could not persuade her for eight months. Afterwards, Ellis noticed that Voden had become much faster and participation in the hunt would not be a problem. Claire closed her eyes and said that she would also try not to regret anything. The maid took the dog away to wash it. Then the heroine decided to ask if they usually don't prepare scarves for the participants. Will you cook for someone? Ellis asked her. Claire replied that it was for Brooks. He said that he would also participate. Ellis asked her to show her a famous clothing store, the heroine, after thinking a little, said that she would like to do the embroidery herself and if there was a person who could help her. Of course, Ellis answered, smiling and saying that this man was standing right in front of her. She then said that Elle was actually better at embroidery and she could never beat him at it. Claire asked who Elle was. They approached a painting of a young man who looked like her. Ellis said it was her brother, Elliot Engels. Is it true that he is handsome, asked Ellis? Yes, the girl answered. Ellis suddenly asked if Elliot was more beautiful than the Marcus. The heroine looked at the picture again and said that she didn't think so. And just like that, time flew by, Ellis helping Claire with the scarf. The day of the hunting competition has arrived. All participants arrived in Ramona Forest, including Claire and Brooks Lawrence. As soon as the heroine descended from the carriage, she gasped at all this beauty. Then Claire turned to Brooks and called him. And holding a handkerchief in her hands, she told him that he was also participating in the competition, so she decided to prepare. Here, please take it, the girl said and handed him the handkerchief. Brooks held out his hand, and Claire said it was a four-leaf clover, which is considered a symbol of good luck. Who made this scarf, Joseph or Ronald? asked Brooks with a smile. No, the girl said incorrectly. This is the clumsy work of a newbie named Claire Lawrence. Brooks was amazed and said, oh my god, you personally made my scarf. The girl shyly said that yes, it was she who wanted to show the sincerity of her feelings. The hero said that this is a very cool gift, and it seems that today he is luckier than the god of luck himself. Then he handed her a box with a bow and said, this is my scarf for you. The girl took the gift and thanked her husband. She opened the box and he asked her if she liked the scarf. The heroine took out a scarf and told him, because he said that the scarf would not be too luxurious. Brooks said it's a pretty modest scarf and anyone would agree. Then he smiled and said that although in this place, many people cannot distinguish luxury from modesty and it is better not for them, 
let Ellis ask. The girl objected, saying that Ellis was his subordinate. And would she answer honestly? He replied that it was hard to trust another. Three months had already passed since they had been together. She laughed and said that he was acting as if they had been together for 30 years. Brooke smiled back at her and said that now it's three months and then it will be 30 years. The heroine looked at him in surprise and said to herself how 30 years old. Then I sadly thought that this was impossible. She looked down and thought about how they had less than a year left in their married life. And Brooks looked at her questioningly. As soon as the hero wanted to say something, she interrupted him, telling him anyway thank you for the gift, but she would not be able to use it as a handkerchief. Brooks smiled and said there are other uses then. Having asked for forgiveness, he turned her back to him and tied a scarf on her ponytail. Brooks said ready and she looked at him in surprise, turning around. The guy with a happy face told his wife that it suits her very well. The heroine also smiled back at him and said that she told him that she couldn't use it as a handkerchief. And then they suddenly shouted about the start of the hunting competition and for all the participants to gather together. Behind the main person overseeing the competition was a board with lists of participants. Claire looked at the lists and said that she was in the initial ones and you turned to Brooks. He read the experts on the board with displeasure. Then he said that it was Will who submitted his application for an expert, and he would go now and change it. The girl replied that it was too late to change. The devil said Brooks with annoyance, and Claire said that she had to go and wished him luck. The heroine stood stretching her arms and preparing for her first competition. Suddenly, from behind, someone hit her right on the back of the head. It turned out to be Emily Smith. She gave Claire a fake smile and said, Oh my God, I didn't bump into you on purpose. You were blocking my path. Be careful. The main character, without raising her head, said her name, Miss Emily Smith. Emily continued sarcastically, asking her if she really decided to participate in the competition, and she would look forward to what artifacts Claire would show this time. The girl looked at her and then said that she was grateful that she was waiting for this and said that she had to go. When Claire turned away from her, Emily looked at her angrily, and the heroine began to think that she somehow didn't see Charlotte, with whom Emily always goes, she came alone or something, and thought that she had better get out of here as soon as possible. But suddenly, Emily stopped her and asked where she was hurrying. The heroine looked at her and said that if she wants to say something, then let her speak quickly. She doesn't have much time. Emily grinned and said that it seems that she has changed a lot after marriage, and it seems that she feels that she is behind the strong back of her husband. Claire told her that she didn't think she should reprimand her about this, but Emily tried to yell at her when Ellis arrived, and calmed her down by saying that she needed to stop. The three of them stood. Emily was very angry. All the people crowded around and watched how this conflict would end. Ha, even Madame Engels is there, Emily said, and added that after all, the rumors are true about the strength of the Marquis's family. Then Claire intervened and told her to be careful with what she said and didn't think Emily would want to step on the same rake again. Or did you forget about what happened last time, the heroine asked. What did you say, Emily said angrily, and she continued with a grin that she was very scared and asked if she was threatening her now. Then leaving, Emily told Claire not to worry, in any case they would not see each other again. Ellis asked Miss Emily if she understood what she was saying now. The heroine suddenly thought why Emily came to her and it didn't seem like she came to quarrel. Suddenly Ellis looked at the heroine and asked what kind of smell was coming from her. Claire replied that she used the perfume that she gave her for her birthday. She said that it was a happy perfume. Ellis, hesitating a little, told her, well, yes, and thought that it seemed to her that the perfume was different. The smell was somehow different. Claire asked her what it was, and she said it was nothing and smiled at her. It's time for us to move, Ellis said, and the girl agreed with her. They went into the forest. Claire saw a rabbit and ran after it, then called Vaudin. Vaudin began to circle around the rabbit, and Claire controlled him perfectly. Now we need to suffocate him with water, she thought. Vaudin began to strangle the rabbit, but the poor thing squeaked pitifully. Claire continued to smother the poor rabbit with water, and the girl began to cry from how pitifully the rabbit looked at her and squeaked. Then she ordered Vaudin to release the rabbit, and he ran into the forest. Claire stood crying and thought about how she couldn't do it. Vaudin approached her and hugged her, and she told him that it was not his fault. She was not ready, so she let him go. The girl, drooping, thought that even if she managed to find good prey, she still would not be able to kill the animal. Suddenly, she sat on her knees and watched beautiful white birds fly and thought how beautiful the Ramon forest is. An idea came to her mind, and with a smile, she invited Vodin to take a walk in the forest. 
After some time, they went out to some lake and the girl told Vaudan how beautiful it was here. She came closer to the lake and bent down. Looking at the water, she noticed how clean the water was, and I thought that I could even see my reflection clearly. The heroine was about to touch the water when she heard some rustling from behind. It was a beautiful deer who looked at her and seemed to understand everything. The deer came very close to the girl and stood next to her and began to drink water. The girl thought that this deer didn't seem to be very afraid of people. The deer began to sniff closer and closer to the girl, and she thought what he was sniffing here all the time and remembered that it was the smell of cookies. Do you want to eat this? The girl said, showing the scarf to the deer, and the heroine opened the handkerchief, placing it on the ground and told him to help himself. The fawn began to eat everything with appetite, and Claire was still touched by him and told him not to rush. But the deer got so carried away that it almost completely ate the scarf itself. The girl shouted to him, No, this cannot be eaten. But the deer got scared and ran away with the handkerchief in its teeth. But the heroine immediately ordered Vodin to catch up with him. Vodin quickly rushed after him and circled around the deer's legs to make him stop. The deer fell. The girl ran closer and saw him lying unconscious. But the scarf was intact and lay next to him. The heroine took the scarf and began to examine it. It turned out to be torn in places. I won't be able to use it anymore. Why did I come here? Claire thought sadly. The girl squatted down and lowered her head and began to cry. Whether she should have gone to these competitions, Vodin is already big, and besides, she will die soon anyway. She began to think that for the first time in her life, she had motivation. But in the end, nothing worked out for her. Then Vodin hugged her again, and she told him that she didn't think she could do it and offered to return. Suddenly, a terrible beast appeared out of nowhere and growled at the girl. She looked at him in fear. Emily's carriage rushed through the Ramona forest. She sat very excited and thought. Emily was thinking about whether she had succeeded. She deliberately provoked Claire in front of everyone. No one realized that this was her plan. This woman is bad, she said. How dare she spread all sorts of rumors. And Charlotte Spring doesn't help me, although I always did everything for her. Suddenly, something happened to the carriage, and Emily suddenly felt bad about whether she could survive. She kept screaming and calling for help that she could no longer breathe. Claire thought that this was a beginner's course. Where did the wolf come from? The wolf growled and jumped on the girl. She turned away in fear and covered her head with her hands. Suddenly, the dagger pierces the wolf's head and he falls. The heroine looks at the wolf in fear and cannot understand what happened, where the dagger came from. Mrs. Lawrence, are you okay? Madame Ellis called to her. She ran up to Claire and apologized that it was so late that she needed to go straight to her, and not to Miss Emily. Miss Emily Smith asked her heroine and wondered if she was then. Ellis interrupted her, saying that her smell attracted monsters and apologized that she didn't understand right away. It was just that someone tried to make sure that she didn't notice anything. Claire suddenly realized why Emily ran into her back then. It was her plan all along. Ellis said that Claire could not stay here, since all the monsters would run away and that she would take her to the starting point. But the heroine objected, saying that this way the monsters could run away in a crowded place. It would be better for her to swim in the lake. Madame Ellis, after thinking a little about the water, said that Vaudin could help her. He could clean it. Okay, I completely forgot about you, Vaudin, then I rely on you, Claire said, and extended her hand. Suddenly, Brooks hugged the heroine from behind and said that it was too cold outside for her to swim. The heroine opened her mouth in surprise to see the Marquis here. She then asked him how he came to be here, if his course was not far from them. Brooke said that he took only one step. The girl clarified by chance, the step not with the help of magic. He answered cheerfully how insightful she was. Don't worry, the guy said, I use cleansing magic. He snapped his fingers and some kind of bright glow appeared around Claire. She looked at everything with delight. The glow continued to circle Brooks and Claire. There was a slight wind and the girl took out her handkerchief and looked at it. I'm done. Brooks said suddenly. The girl thanked him for his help. Claire looked at her husband and handed him the handkerchief, saying that she couldn't save it. It was all her fault. Brooks looked at her and said there was nothing wrong with it. I took Claire's hands in which there was a scarf and it miraculously turned into a beautiful blue rose. Claire couldn't take her eyes off the magic that was happening before her eyes. The hero took this flower and attached it to her hair. Then, after admiring his wife, he said that it suits her very well. The girl looked at him with admiration and gratitude, and thought to herself, Brooks Lawrence helped me. Let's go, the guy said, and turned around and said to Ellis that the competition was not over yet, but they had better come back. 
Alice said she would go with them then too, but Brooks told her no. You can enjoy the hunt, he said, and left with Claire. Ellis laughed and said that if you think about it, she hasn't caught anything yet and she'll still look around a little and let them go. Claire turned to her and said with a smile, Okay, thank you, Madam Ellis, we'll go. Ellis bowed after them and thought about something. As she stood, warriors came to her and pointed their swords at her. It's good that you're paying attention. We could have just cut your throat, the man said. He continued that his plan was to attack animals, not people. Ellis looked at him questioningly, and he introduced himself as Will, the chief assistant to the Marcus of Lawrence, who, despite all the difficulties, remains his faithful servant. She continued to remain silent. Will asked how she felt about talking to him calmly. He suddenly asked her if it was she who gave that perfume to Mrs. Lawrence. Ellis replied that she did not do anything that could harm her. Will said with a smile that he doesn't blame her for this in any case. He already checked everything, so there is no problem with it. Ellis said nervously that he had a strange sequence of actions. He replied that the missus was very important to the Marquis, and if something happened to her, Ellis could easily be killed. But let's get down to business, said Will and asked why she came to Mrs. Lawrence. I've already said everything, Madam Ellis replied. A strange woman in a robe appeared at the Engels' mansion. She introduced herself to Ellis and said that her name was Catherine, and she had come to pick up her things. Catherine said that it was about a music box, which was a bird with a broken neck in a cage with the name Elijah written on it. Ellis said that she knew nothing and that she should leave, and she replied that she was the owner of the box. Ellis got angry and asked where the proof was that it was hers, and she hadn't heard anything about this woman. Catherine asked if she would believe her if she told everything in three months. Ellis's older brother was to become the head of the Engels family. Ellis was dumbfounded and wanted to say something, but a woman interrupted her and said that Count Engels had gone missing and would die in three months. But father may return earlier, Ellis objected, and Catherine replied that he would not return. Because, she continued, Brooks Lawrence must have already killed him. Ellis froze in bewilderment and didn't know what to say. Then she continued her story, that after that, she accidentally met Mrs. Clare at a tea party. They began a conversation under the pretext of an interest in magic. And she added, saying that she did not want to harm Mrs. in any way. Will asked her if she knew anything about the woman in the cloak. Ellis replied that the woman had gray hair and they had not found the music box she was talking about. Perhaps she did not exist from the very beginning. Ellis continued, it seems that was her goal. Will interrupted her and said that he would convey her entire story to the Marquis. The assistant began to wonder whether the woman in the cloak wanted to show that she was now in the capital or whether she was pursuing another goal. And suddenly Ellis told him that she also wanted to know something. Well, let's ask, said Will. She asked him if it was true that Count Engels had died. Yes, Will answered, and Ellis whispered, it means he was killed. The assistant asked her if she was thinking about how to take revenge. She replied that by no means she was just sorry that she could not kill him. Will asked her in surprise how to kill it. Ellis said he was a very stern man and had no concept of family. He just said rubbish, she said and said that she was afraid that he might come back, and therefore she said thank you for killing him. The assistant was shocked by her story, but did not say anything about it. Claire and Brooks were riding a white horse at that time. The guy asked her if she was comfortable. She replied that everything was fine. Then she asked him if he didn't need to hunt now. He replied with a smile that he had already caught what he was supposed to. The girl turned away and said that means he had already caught the prey. He replied, well, yes. Claire wondered why she was so annoyed because it was normal. She seemed to become more emotional after going back to the past. She threw away all these thoughts and asked him, smiling, what he had caught. Brooks said that this was a secret, because he wanted to surprise her. The girl agreed, saying that it was such a tradition to dedicate the booty to her lover. Then he asked her about her catch, because she also wanted to catch a deer for him, didn't she? The heroine said that it was an accident. The deer just fell on the grass. He replied that an accident was also not bad. They galloped on and the heroine again saw those same white birds and said, wow. She looked up and thought how incredible it was that she had only recently wondered what she forgot at the competition and was so pissed off about everything. But now she was glad to be here. Claire looked at Brooks and thought maybe it was all because of him. Well done, Claire, the hero suddenly told her. She smiled back at him and said that he was also great. They arrived at the very beginning of the Ramon Forest Point. Most of the participants had already gathered there and were discussing something huge lying on the ground and wondering who could have done it. 
and Claire stood up with her mouth open. Someone asked Brooks if he really did it, and he proudly replied that he did. Brooks stood next to the huge green beast and told Claire that he was the one who caught this sea beast especially for her. Claire was shocked and could only say thank you, but the guy said that the beast was not very beautiful, and he knew that it was not what she expected, so he prepared something for her, and he handed her a beautiful white rabbit, which was very similar to the one that she could not strangle. She looked at the rabbit in surprise and asked Brooks what he wanted to do with the rabbit. Was it really a scarf? And he said, this is what you think of me. I was joking, Claire said laughing and hugged the rabbit. Evening, Brooks sat in his office and read the letter. The letter said the Bronsons have forgiven me. Brooks read it, thought about something, crumpled the letter and threw it away, then asked the assistant what it meant. Will replied that maybe this means that Catherine got into Bronson and maybe she instigated Emily Smith. Brooks said he noticed Emily acting suspiciously. The assistant said that after that she was found dead in the carriage. The cause of death was a heart attack, but Brooks replied that it was not a heart attack. It all happened because of black magic. He felt a faint trace of magic. Then the hero said that Emily Smith does not have magic, but this was someone who has very good abilities. Will then deduced that this meant she was targeting Mrs. Clare. Brooks, closing his eyes, said that everyone knows that the Duke does not care about his eldest daughter and needs Claire to be perceived only as Lawrence. The assistant asked if Catherine might be in cahoots with Duke Bronson. The hero said that he didn't think so, he wouldn't act so rashly. Brooks, after thinking for a moment, told the deputy to check who Emily Smith was in contact with and where she went. Will bowed before the master and said that they were already working on it, and there was no need to worry that Bronson would find out about it. They had already collected enough evidence anyway. Okay, Brooks said and told the assistant he could go. Greedy Brooks told Chloe in his ear, you need to protect Waldorf's only daughter, but in return, you will have to get rid of Bronson. And she continued that this way this child can gain freedom. Assistant Will and Servant Mason met in the castle corridor. Assistant Will asked him why he was here if now was not the right time for a report. The Marquis was not in the mood. Mason said that if it was because of Catherine then it would definitely be a matter of time before they found her. No, said Will. The Marcus always gets upset when it comes to the Bronson family. The servant angrily said that he thought it was because the opportunity to take revenge on them was approaching. Assistant Will told him that this was not so. It was all because of Mrs. Clare. Brooks was originally a strange person, but he changed after his wedding. He's gotten weirder, Deputy Will blurted out. The servant asked him if it was good. The assistant said that it was possible... Then he thought about choosing a gift, and Will began to remember the moment when he discussed the gift with Brooks. The gentleman then asked that the luxurious gift was too much of a burden for the girl, and the assistant only opened his mouth in puzzlement. Will asked the gentleman if he was talking about a gift for Mrs. Lawrence. Brooks said that Claire is slowly starting to get used to this life. That's why I don't want to give something simple, the hero said, and Will asked if he was turning to him now. Then the Marquis said that nothing could be done he would have to give her a white rose. Rosa was asked by his assistant. Brooks replied that yes, she should like it. Will agreed that the missus would definitely like the gift. And Brooks looked sternly at the assistant for making fun of him like that. Then the hero said that this is not what he would like to give. And he also said that he would like to give a more meaningful gift, after which she would not grumble at him. The assistant, after thinking a little, asked if he would like to receive a kiss from missus after the gift. Apologizing again for his words, Will thought that this would be such a good occasion. He wondered how Mr. looked at Claire differently, and how he was sincere towards Mrs. On the battlefield, Brooks Lawrence is more of a tough demon. But with her, he is different. Who knew that he could be like that? Will said. And in his head he began to imagine how the gentleman looked at her with loving eyes and gave her flowers. Then he summed up that these are still good changes. God, the master has changed for the better, the servant Mason asked, not believing it. Claire came to visit Ellis at the Engels mansion. They were drinking tea, and Ellis said that she wanted to say something to the heroine. Claire asked her that it seemed she did not want to say earlier in front of the Marquis. Then she said that she was surprised by the fact that she sent a carriage for her. Ellis said she wanted to apologize to her. After a short pause, she continued that in fact she was pursuing some goal by communicating with her. The heroine thought after hearing that Ellis was pursuing a goal. Then closing her eyes, Ellis said that she wanted to know about the Marquise's family, but she had no intention of harming them. However, she in no way justified her motive for her actions. Claire drank tea and said with a sigh, 
Who among the nobles does something for no reason? She began to remember the words of Brooks. He told her that he thought it was possible to separate from Ellis Engels. If Miss Engels had bad intentions, Brooks would not have left it that way, the heroine thought. Ellis asked Claire if she would accept her apology. The girl smiled and said that everything is fine. She doesn't have to worry, she forgives her. Ellis asked her in surprise if she was angry. She replied that nothing had happened to her, but Ellis did not let up and began to say even more persistently that to some extent it was a betrayal on her part, and for some reason Claire was not embarrassed by this. Now the heroine was surprised and told her that she had never looked at this situation in this way. Ellis lowered her gaze and said that she thought they were really close, but it seemed that the mistress was not counting on her. Claire couldn't understand why she was saying that and stared at her. She wasn't disappointed, Ellis told herself. Ellis thought about Mrs. Claire Lawrence. She had never met someone like that. She is very calm and peaceful. When they are together, Ellis feels calm. And Ellis thought that Claire felt this way too. But it turned out that she didn't expect anything at all from their communication. The heroine suddenly turned to her and said that if Ellis wants to say something, then let him say it. Clearing her throat, Ellis asked the lady if she would like to become her friend. Claire asked her friend, surprised by this, and the heroine suddenly remembered Tom, how he extended his hand to her and said, we are friends forever. He was the only friend with whom they started a relationship and got married. But all those words were empty promises. We are friends forever, now the heroine is indifferent to such words. However, I'm a pretty ordinary person, Claire suddenly said, and she continued that even if Ellis communicated with her, she would not receive any benefit from it. Ellis was dumbfounded and said that she was not looking for benefits. All she wanted was to talk to her like that over a cup of tea. Then, lowering her head, she said that she asked for forgiveness because she wanted to get her consent to friendship. Are you against it? Ellis asked the lady. Claire sat silently, not knowing what to say. Then Ellis said that if the lady doesn't want to, she can refuse. Then she will return to loneliness and will no longer be friends with anyone. The heroine suddenly realized who this style of communication reminded her of. She remembered how Brooks gave her a rose and said that if she did not accept the rose, then he would have no choice but to burn the whole garden. Claire began to think that she and Ellis did not know each other well enough. And besides, she did not know if this friendship would be beneficial for her. But the girl continued to think soon the Marcus would leave her anyway. There's less than a year left before he kills her and gets rid of the Bronsons. Therefore, this will not harm her in any way, the heroine thought and said to Madame Ellis, Okay, we will all see each other again. And she added that she didn't want to be alone in the mansion all the time. Ellis thanked her and asked if the mistress would allow her to be a little more impudent. And she asked the lady if she could call her by name and not speak formally. Can you do it? Ellis asked the heroine and she thought about it. After thinking for a moment, Claire smiled and said to Ellis, Claire and Brooks were having dinner in the living room and talking. She told him that she and Madame Ellis Engels were now friends. Then she said that she didn't know if it was right to call their relationship a friendship, and Brooks said that if they were close, then it was friendship. You talked a lot with Madame Engels, didn't the hero ask? She asked the Marquis if he had friends, and he said that for some reason this question hurt him. The girl began to continue asking if he really had no friends because he communicates well with many. Brooks replied that yes, with many, but these are not friends. For him, his wife is more significant. The heroine was a little shocked by his words and said that she understood him. Do you want to ask anything else? Brooks said. And she began to think. Then Claire asked him, because there is another person close to him, isn't it? She is talking about assistant Will. And he replied that she should not exaggerate. By the way, as I understand it, the owner of the Engels family will soon change. The heroine asked, Yes, I heard it too. Brooks answered, The hero said that there are a lot of rumors about this and asked if she considers such a person handsome. The girl answered yes. He said that he was not talking about himself now, but about Ellis's brother. And Claire replied that he was handsome and looked like Ellis. The hero put drawings with sketches of dresses on the table and told the heroine to choose what she liked. The girl asked in surprise why the dress was needed. She already had enough of them, but the hero said that soon there would be a ball in honor of the hunting competition. Then he said that her dress should match his clothes. Claire asked if she had to go. He replied that if she didn't want to, she didn't have to go. Brooks said that, however, he could not help but go, since he received first place in the competition, and for this he needed a partner. He had no other close people, so it would be a little awkward for him. And then the girl agreed to go with him. 
but the girl said that she didn't need a new dress, she didn't want to stand out too much. Brooks only replied that the more delicious food you eat, the better your receptors become, and it seems that she is not yet accustomed to luxury. He said that from now on, all clothes and food would be better than she had before, and added that he wanted to see on her what she would really like. A couple of days later, Claire was still wondering which dress she should choose. Brooks, sipping tea with a smile, said that he had already paid for each model of dress and did not want to see these dresses on other misses. The girl asked in surprise whether he really bought all this. The girl asked him why he spent money on a model of dresses that she would not even wear. These are not just models, Brooks said, and snapped his fingers as these drawings immediately turned into real dresses and swirled above her head. The heroine looked at them and could not believe her eyes. Brooks said that it would be better for her to try everything on herself so that she could decide which one she liked best. The girl reconciled herself and said, okay, it's his money and he can use it as he wants. The hero laughed in response and said, thank you for the permission. She looked at the model again and settled on a green dress and said that she liked it. The guy asked if she would be cold in this dress. There were other options, but she said that it was okay. She would be indoors. He thought for a while and said, okay, she can try it on, and the girl thanked him. The girl tried on this charming green dress, and looking at herself in the mirror, she was finally satisfied. Brooks looked at his wife and said she looked beautiful in everything she wore. She thanked him and said that she thought she needed to work on her posture. The hero raised his eyebrows and asked if his praise didn't seem sincere to her. Anyway, Brooks said, and looked at her neck and said she was missing a necklace. She looked at herself in the mirror and said that she was not sure that it was needed here. Brooks told her not to worry. They would find her something that would suit her. Now Claire also asked him if he hadn't heard how sincere her words were. He laughed, and she said that he was probably thinking that she looked like a fool. No way, Brooks said and pulled her towards him and kissed her. And after the kiss, he said that he was just glad that he had such a sweet wife. The girl blushed and coughed to tell him not to act like a womanizer, and Brooks replied how rude she was, because she was the only woman in his life. We don't know what will happen next, Claire said sadly. Thinking a little about her words, Brooks grabbed her hand, pulled her towards him and kissed her. She tried to break free and moaned for him to let her go, but the hero continued to kiss her. Then the heroine finally broke away from his kiss, and having caught her breath, said that she almost suffocated. The guy looked at her very strangely, and she did not understand what this look meant. Brooks then coughed and asked for forgiveness. The girl sternly told him that his joke had gone too far. He just smiled at her and said that he would be careful in future. The heroine wanted to tell him something else, but he interrupted her and said that if she chose this dress, they would make the dress to her size and return it to her ready-made. I went, Brooks said, and turned around and went to the door. The girl remained frozen in one place and thought that it had come over him. Brooks walked and thought what was wrong with him. He was suddenly overwhelmed by emotions and before he had always controlled his emotions. He just didn't want to hear any words of refusal or submission coming from her mouth. Suddenly, the hero stood up and hit the post with his fist and said that this really didn't look like him. The next day, Ellis sat with Claire at breakfast and complained that no one took her even though she did well in the hunting competition. Ellis then asked the lady if she had a place for her. Claire replied that she couldn't interfere in these matters, and didn't she herself say that she didn't need anything from her. Ellis said that she could pass the entrance exam herself and just wanted to get a place in the exam, but the heroine told her that she could not promise anything and apologized to her. The girl suddenly asked Ellis why she had come today, she replied that she wanted to warn in advance that in honor of the hunting competition, a ball would be held by the Imperial family where Reacher and Bronson were to announce their engagement. Claire looked at her, then lowered her head and said that it means it's time for this. Tom and Samantha, the heroine thought that they would never see each other again, and I didn't expect that they could meet so soon. The girl then smiled at Ellis and continued drinking her tea. Ellis thought about her, how she hides her emotions very well and it seems to her that now she is hiding something. Will the day ever come when she can trust someone? But Ellis suddenly thought sadly that she would never become such a person for her. Little Brooks stood at the window, the rain was pouring heavily. Chloe called him and asked him if he didn't like the way she looked. Listen to me, she said. The more you don't have, the more you want to appear more luxurious because such people don't want to be looked down on. Chloe continued by saying that this baby was beautiful and that she looked like she could wear a red dress. But oddly enough, Chloe herself began to wear more and more regular casual clothes. 
But I tell you again, she told him, that a bright dress looks more beautiful. Brooks said he doesn't care about clothes as clothes. Chloe told him that you could be born with everything but be completely empty inside, and asked if he thought she should at least dress nicely. That wasn't how Brooks responded, and she said he was right, but he would soon fall in love with luxury, too. And in the end, he will look for love. There is nothing more beautiful than love, but she does not know if he will ever be able to love. Chloe said about Claire that this child is beautiful, and she thinks a red dress would suit her. In the end, Brooks said he still likes the color red. The girl at breakfast asked him if he wanted another dress. No, it's okay, Brooks said. Then Claire joked that she thought he had already sufficiently improved the country's economy with his purchases, and he laughed in response. The hero began to think that he would never have thought that his wife could refuse him. Something happened, the heroine asked him, and he replied that he wanted to say that this green dress suits her white skin very well. Then he smiled and said that although he likes red, green is not bad either. The girl thanked him. He nodded silently in response. Then Brooks left, saying he had business to do. When the hero left, he slammed his fist on the open door and walked out. Claire thought he was behaving strangely. And I decided to ask Will's assistant if he happened to know that there might be a problem with Brooks in the dress. He said no. Smiling at her, he replied that he thought it was because she was very beautiful. The girl said that he was not telling the truth. It seems that Brooks told him what was wrong. Nobody told me anything, Deputy Will answered. The assistant began to remember a recent conversation with Brooks. He was sitting at his desk and tapping his fingers on it. Will told him that he could ask Mrs. Clare to change into a different dress. Brooks told him that what matters is what Clare likes, nothing else matters. The assistant dared to say that the gentleman did not care at all about the fact of what Mrs. would be wearing. The hero threatened him that he could cut his bonuses. He asked why he was immediately dumping everything on him. Deputy Will then asked him if he knew when he started acting weird. Brooks looked at him questioningly, and he continued that when he can't stand in front of the missus to say what he likes and what he doesn't, and asked why he behaves this way in front of her, Brooks suddenly said that he did not like him and only loved his wife. In any case, the assistant continued, if you don't say it, I'll do it instead of you. Mrs. should know about your true feelings. The hero got angry and told him not to cross the line. And as soon as Brooks got up from his seat, the maid suddenly came in and said that it was time to leave and that she would go and warn the missus. Assistant Will and the maid bowed to Brooks and were about to leave. But the hero told the assistant that he was very lucky today. The maid looked at Will's assistant, then at her master with concern and fear. When they left the office, Will told the maid that he was grateful that she came in on time. It was time for the ball. Claire and Brooks arrived at the luxurious castle. All the guests of the evening stood on the red carpet and looked with interest at their carriage. As soon as Brooks and Claire got off the carriage, everyone began to whisper that the Marquis and Marchioness Lawrence had arrived. One of the girls said that Mrs. Lawrence became much more beautiful after she got married. And the complexion became better, someone said, and Claire walked and heard it all. Already in the hall, some girls began to ask the heroine. One asked what cosmetics she uses, and the dress is very beautiful, who sewed it? And the other said that the missus has such beautiful skin. Claire thanked them for the compliment with a smile. The men standing near Brooks were talking about the new tax policy, but he did not listen to them. He looked only at his wife, and Brooks looked at her neckline and thought about something of his own. Someone standing next to him called him, and he apologized and said that he was a little distracted. The hero took a glass from a passing waiter, and he asked him if he liked the ball. Will is you, Brooks said, and asked what kind of outfit he was wearing. The assistant replied that it was so cold today, he decided that the cape would be perfect for the weather. Brooks stood and thought about something again. Claire stood not far from him with the girls. Will asked him what he didn't like, and the Marquis replied that he told him not to cross the line and asked how much the cape cost. Three, the assistant said and pointed with his fingers, and Brooks, in bewilderment, said 300 gold pieces, because this is robbery. The assistant told him not to waste time on trifles. Didn't he himself say that he would prepare the best for his beloved? Brooks looked at him and said, good hands. The assistant said excellent and gave him the cape, then wished him to enjoy the ball. As Brooks stood with the cape in his hands, someone came up to him and said, long time no see, Marquis Lawrence. It was Claire's father, the hero did not expect to see him. Your Excellency Duke Bronson, the guy greeted him. The Duke asked him how he was doing. Claire at this time went out onto the terrace to get some fresh air. She was very tired. She thought about how few people had spoken to her at such evenings before. Then she felt cold and wanted to go inside, when suddenly someone also came out onto the terrace. 
The heroine turned around and saw Tom reach her. Claire told him, shouldn't he have left the terrace after he saw that there was someone there? I wanted to meet you, Tom said. What happened, Sir Reacher? The heroine asked him. He got angry, clenched his fist, and told her not to call him that. After a short silence, Tom said that she had a beautiful dress, and he was sorry that she had married a man who would not allow her to wear the clothes that she liked. Claire frowned and asked what he was talking about. Tom replied that she had never worn anything like this before her wedding. She had always liked simple clothes, and they suited her very well. The girl told him that she actually liked the dress, and she screamed that it was her choice. He couldn't believe it and asked her again if it was her choice. Claire closed her eyes and said that she liked it. Tom was perplexed and began to shout that he couldn't believe it. He covered his ears and stood, and the girl looked at him and was in shock. Then the heroine told him that she didn't think they had anything else to talk about. When she said that she was leaving and wanted to take a step, Tom grabbed her hand and asked her to stop. Claire asked him what he was doing and asked him to let go of his hand. But Tom continued to hold on and asked her if she was happy that she married Brooks. The heroine replied that she was satisfied with everything. Then she said, let me go again, pulled her hand back and left. Tom turned around to stop her, but it was too late. Claire had left. The girl entered the hall and thought that even inside it had become cool. But suddenly Brooks came up to her from behind and carefully put a cape on her shoulders and said that it's cool today, isn't it? Claire looked at him gratefully. As they stood, some girl approached them and, apologizing, asked the Marcus Lawrence if she could invite him to dance. Brooks politely told her that due to his leg injury, he would not be able to dance with her. The girl, confused, said okay and walked away. And when she had already walked away, she said that this was happening to him. Brooks then extended his hand to his wife and asked if she would dance with him. Claire asked, what about your leg? He answered with a smile that it was almost healed. And she told him that, well, he was very good at healing magic. Brooks replied that he was so good at it that he used pain-relieving magic for it. They started dancing and the girl told him that he was a great dancer and he smiled at her. Then he leaned closer to her face and winked and said that it was all because she was with him. As they danced, Tom Reacher watched them, looking gloomier than a cloud. Tom stood and couldn't believe his eyes and the words she had said before still couldn't get out of his head. He thought about her, remembered their childhood together, the past, and that Tom was her only friend who was always with her. So why is Claire with this man Tom didn't let up? And suddenly his memories suddenly turned into others, unfamiliar to him now, where Claire asked to stay with her for a while. And as her body disappeared in the coffin along with Brooks through some portal, Tom shouted, no, bring it back. The guy thought and did not understand what kind of memories these were. And Samantha came up to him, worried about what had happened to him, and asked if he was okay. Yes, everything is fine, Tom suddenly said to Ellie. Samantha was dumbfounded about Ellie. Tom left, covering his face with his hand and saying what he just said and apologized to Samantha, telling her that he was not feeling well and would go out for a while. Samantha was left wondering who Ellie was. He wasn't dating another woman. Although trash like him could do that, she thought. Claire and Brooks finished dancing and then bowed to each other. The Marquis offered her a glass of champagne. She thanked him and said that she really wanted to drink something. Then Samantha approached the heroine and called her. Long time no see, honey, said Samantha. Brooks looked at her, and she said she needed to talk to her sister. Then she smiled and asked Claire if she could give her some time. They went out onto the terrace and Samantha told her that she was engaged. Claire answered with a smile that it means the time had already come and congratulated her on her engagement. Samantha sadly told her sister that she didn't really want to get engaged, and she added that she greatly admires her and Brooks. Then she continued that if she had a choice, she would have wanted to choose her own groom. But in the end, she did as her mother said. Claire was just silent, and Samantha suddenly said, what if she asks them for help? She looked at her sister with hope, and then turned away and said that no, it was better for her to forget. There was nothing she could do about it anyway. Claire asked her sister what happened. She answered nothing. She was on the right path. Samantha then smiled and said everything was fine. The main character did not understand that this was happening to her sister. And Sister Claire, smiling, asked her for forgiveness and said that it was her mistake to tell her such a thing immediately after a month of engagement. Then she said that it was time for her to leave and Claire told her not to worry. Tom definitely loves her. Samantha turned to her, smiled and said yes and walked away. The heroine was left thinking that with her sister, maybe she had premarital depression. Tom truly loves Samantha, Claire knows this better than anyone. But whether Samantha loves Tom, 
the heroine is not sure. When Claire entered the hall, she saw Samantha with her mother and Duke Bronson standing and talking. Claire looked at them and said to herself that she seemed to be thinking too much. After all, Samantha doesn't have to get married if she doesn't want to. Besides, the main thing is that Duke and Duchess Bronson protect Samantha. They will not allow her to be unhappy. Then Brooks approached Claire with drinks and asked if she had already talked to her sister. The girl said that they talked about her engagement. Not everything was going smoothly for them. Brooks said that it seemed like her sister was keeping the bar low, and the heroine responded that she thought Samantha made a good choice. Tom Reacher is the best groom in the Empire, said the girl. The hero said that it was because he was already married, and Claire told him that he was very confident in himself. The girl continued that she thinks Tom is a good option. It's not for nothing that he is considered the best groom. Brooks told her that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover because its content is much more important, and Claire told him that this was coming from a man who really loved luxurious clothes. He said he could take off his clothes if she wanted. Claire was surprised, and he said that it was because he was even more gorgeous under his clothes. What are you talking about blushing, the heroine said, and he replied that he said that under this outerwear, he has the same chic clothes. The girl said that she had understood everything wrong, and he told her with a smile that she blushed. I know, Claire said and touched her cheek. Why are you so cute, Brooks told her. The girl looked at him questioningly, and the hero approached her and kissed her. Claire, blushing even more, told him that people were looking at them, and he was attracting attention as always. He laughed and said that he liked her confused expression. It was a pity that this moment would not last long, but people were immediately attracted by something completely different. They began to whisper and turn around, saying, My God, look at this. Samantha stood there with Tom Reacher and the Empress in front of them. Claire saw them and said the same thing to the Empress, and next to her were Tom and Samantha. The Empress suddenly said that they had good news for all the guests. The heroine lowered her gaze and thought that she didn't really want to look at it. Brooks saw out of the corner of his eye that his wife was a little nervous and took her hand. She didn't expect it at first, but then looked at him with gratitude. And she began to think about Brooks. It's interesting that this man, before the heroine went into the past, he also treated Samantha well as her. No, the girl thought. This is a stupid question. She already knows what happened and how. In half a year, Marquis Lawrence will kill the entire Bronson family. And he will also kill his wife from the Bronson family. The girl thought that she already knew how her life would end. The next day, the heroine walked in the garden and admired the flowers. Then Miss Ellis came up to her and said that the garden was very beautiful. The girl looked at her and asked why she came without saying a word. Ellis replied with a smile that she had come for an interview with the Lawrence Knights. She then said that she decided to come to her for a while and asked if she would mind if she became a vassal of the Lawrence family. Claire told her that she didn't mind at all and would even be glad. Ellis thanked her and bid her farewell, telling her to wish her well. The maid asked the mistress what she thought, whether Ellis would be taken or not. The heroine replied that she didn't even know if she would succeed. After some time, Claire and Ellis were sitting at the table and drinking tea. The heroine asked her what she thought, whether there would be a positive verdict. Ellis replied that few people could refuse such a capable person like her. Then the heroine answered well and said that she wanted to ask her if her husband's birthday was just around the corner. And she doesn't know what gift to give him. Ellis replied that this was not an easy task because the Marquise was very difficult to surprise and in fact, she had never given gifts to men except Elle. Then it suddenly dawned on Ellis and she said, oh right, we can ask Elle. The heroine looked at her in bewilderment as to how they would ask him and the knight said that he just arrived at the mansion today. Suddenly, Brooks came and asked if he could come in. Claire told him that he came early today, but they decided to go to the Engels' mansion. She would like to meet Elle. Brooks became gloomy and asked if she had really decided to go to the Engels' mansion, and he asked Claire what she wanted to talk to Elle about. The girl didn't know what to answer, not to tell him that she was going to Elle to ask what was the best gift to buy for Brooks. Then she told him that she just wanted to see him. Don't worry, Ellis said. I'll give you your wife back before evening. Brooks was seething with anger, then said that he would send a carriage for them to get there. Ellis said that there was no need to worry so much. They could have provided their own carriage. Brooks said no with a smile because he wanted to make sure he wouldn't be eating dinner alone. Ellis giggled and said that he seemed to feel lonely a lot. Claire intervened in their conversation and told Ellis that Brooks was just joking and that she should not fall for it. The heroine then smiled at her husband and said that she would be back soon. Brooks stood silently and watched his wife leave with Miss Ellis. 
Then Will told the owner that maybe it was time to admit it, and Brooks said no, he doesn't love her. And he asked, what is the reason for love? He doesn't have one, you can fall in love without a reason. He thought that maybe he still loved her, but he drove these thoughts away from himself and thought that this couldn't be true. What was wrong with him? Assistant Will looked at his master and thought, God, what a slowpoke he is. When Claire and Ellis were driving to the mansion, the heroine thought about something. Ellis asked her what she was thinking about. She replied that it was nothing. Then she decided to say that she thought Brooks looked strange and wondered what was wrong. Ellis asked her if she really didn't understand. The girl looked at her questioningly. Then Ellis said that the Marquise was jealous of her for Elle because the Marquis loved her very much. The girl replied that this was definitely not the case. The heroine began to think that he couldn't think like that. He was just playing the role of a good husband. Ellis suddenly asked her how the dance party went. She heard that Reacher had announced his engagement and what was he even thinking about when he made such an announcement when Claire was also there. The girl told her that they wanted to show everyone their place. The royal family wanted to celebrate the reunion of Reacher and Bronson, so they wanted their power, Claire continued. Ellis told her that she said that as if it concerned her, and Claire replied that she was just sad about it. Of course she was annoyed by the fact that she ran into Tom. And Samantha, living in the same house, had never really communicated with Claire before. Samantha always felt awkward being around her, but she was so small that Claire never got offended by her. And Ellis asked why she thought the Marquis didn't love her. She replied that she was the eldest daughter of the Bronson family and she was supposed to marry Lawrence. If Claire had married Tom, then Brooks would have proposed to Samantha. That's all. In other words, Brooks would have behaved exactly the same way the heroine ended up with her. Ellis said sadly that she didn't think it was like that. And the girl smiled at her and said that she knew for sure that this was so. Claire began to think that she actually became greedy the more time they spent together. The more she wishes she could become a little special for him. She already shows her greed by this. It's better not to even count on more. After all, she can die with a smile on her face. The heroine told Ellis that since she met Samantha, she can't think about it. It's strange, she really asked. Ellis said that this is normal because Brooks is her husband. And this is the first time she has ever heard Claire tell her something like that. And she is glad that they have become a little closer. Claire smiled and said she reminded her of Brooks. Ellis was surprised and asked how they were similar and the heroine replied that they were similar because she was also a little strange. Why am I weird? I want an explanation, Ellis said. And Claire just laughed and thought about how she used to think Ellis had an ulterior motive when she said she wanted to be friends with her. But now the girl doesn't think about it, since she will die soon anyway. That's why she said that she doesn't mind being friends with her. And now Claire realizes how nice it is to be with Ellis. I wonder how she will feel when Claire dies. And the heroine became friends with her because she knew that her days were numbered. It was very selfish of her. Ellis stared at her with great curiosity, and the girl smiled and replied that one day she would tell her everything. And she also said that she would like that after she tells her this, she would pretend that she doesn't know anything. Ellis's words made her worry even more. Claire thought that she wanted everyone to think it was an accident. And she wants everyone to forget about the Lawrence family tragedy, to forget about her, to forget about all of this. They had already arrived at the mansion and were talking to Elle about the gift. He said, why not give Claire something she is good at doing? Ellis asked him if that was all he had to offer, and he replied that the best gift was a sincere gift. Ellis was shocked. She said that they already know this. Why did she bring Claire to the mansion then? Elle asked his sister and Claire for forgiveness, and the heroine told him not to worry. He helped her a lot. She thought about a gift that only she could give. The heroine came home and told the servant and assistant that she needed their help. They looked at each other and Mason said displeasedly that of course he could help her in his free time, but why try so hard when the owner doesn't care about his day? On the contrary, Will was delighted and said that the owner would be very happy to receive a gift from her. The girl thanked them and asked them to keep this a secret from Brooks. Of course we won't tell anything, they said, and Claire left. A few days later, the heroine stood at the mirror and tried on a luxurious dress. Then Brooks came and said that she was very beautiful and that her appearance would outshine the bride and groom. The heroine replied that Samantha would be in charge today and Claire would not attract attention. Actually, I thought that you would not go to the engagement, said the hero. Claire replied that she had no intention of going, but then changed her mind. I want to see for myself, the heroine said. And Brooks asked what she wanted to see. The heroine smiled at him and said, let's go. Brooks thought for a moment and realized that she seemed determined. 
and he too, like Tom, wants to see Samantha as his wife. And he wants to make sure that this is not a sweet nightmare, but reality. Wedding hall, Tom Reacher adjusts his suit and prepares for the groom's entrance. Samantha came to him and told him that he was very handsome today. He thanked her and said that she looked very good too. Samantha decided to tell him that her sister was coming today too. Tom asked why she should go if she would not sincerely enjoy this holiday. Samantha thought about her fiancé, that it seemed like he was a normal person, but in reality he was so narrow-minded, and why should she be with him? Tom's fiancé asked him if his headache bothered him anymore. He replied that no, he had been sleeping well lately and had no headaches. Samantha said with a smile that it was good and offered to straighten his tie. Tom thought to himself that he did the right thing when he chose Samantha, and soon the strange dreams with headaches should completely go away. Done, she said and smiled at him. Tom thanked her. Samantha then said that she also needed to get ready, and it was time to go. The wedding hall, the ceremony takes place. Tom and Samantha exchange rings in front of witnesses and a spiritual representative. Tom puts the ring on her finger. She smiles and presses her hands to her chest. Then the bride and groom exchange vows of love and fidelity. As Samantha read the vows, Tom heard someone enter and noticed them out of the corner of his eye. It was the Marquis and Marchioness Lawrence the groom did not expect to see them. Tom said to himself, Claire, why did you come? And suddenly his head hurt again, and the same memories began of Brooks taking Claire's body. And Tom shouts after him, please return Archduke Lawrence, and also memories associated with Claire, how she asks him if he will be late today. And the girl is left alone, sad and Tom couldn't do anything. And suddenly Tom Reacher faints from all these memories and an unbearable headache. All the guests are shocked, Samantha too, and screams what happened to him. The exhausted bride sat down next to Tom and kept saying his name so that he would wake up. Brooks said that Tom Reacher has passed out and it looks like the engagement ceremony should be put on hold. The main character asked what happened to him. After all, Tom is a healthy person, this has never happened to him. The Marquis looked at her and asked if she was really worried about him. But the girl was a little confused and replied that no, she just didn't want to see him again. Too quick an answer, the hero thought, and looked suspiciously at his wife. Then he smiled at her and said not to worry, they won't see each other again. Claire smiled back at him and agreed with him. After a short silence, Brooks said that it was very noisy here and suggested leaving. The girl answered okay. As she left, the heroine turned around one last time to look at Tom. Brooks and Claire were having breakfast in the garden and the hero said that Tom had been unconscious for several days and knights usually don't have this often, but it seemed like he really was very ill. The girl replied that yes, it seems like that. Then the girl added that Tom has a good doctor so he will recover quickly. And she asked Brooks if she could go to the Engels mansion because she wanted to spend the evening with Ellis. The hero smiled at her and replied that there was no need to go, they would soon go to them together. Claire asked him when they could go there. Ellis felt lonely. Since Count Elliot would not be in the mansion for a month, he replied, that means the Count was not in the mansion. Then Brooks said with a smile that their trip would then be canceled and she could go on her own. What? Claire asked him and wondered why he changed his mind. The hero told her that she herself could decide when and where to go. Have a good time, Brooks said and was about to leave. The girl just said okay and was left wondering what was wrong with him. Brooks Lawrence was walking and thinking that he'd been acting strange lately. Then he stopped and told himself that he needed to keep his distance from her. A few hours later, Brooks came down to the hall and saw his wife being helped to dress by maids. The hero asked her that they were already preparing for the trip. The girl answered yes. Claire said that she was thinking about buying Ellis a gift in exchange for her invitation to the mansion. Brooks listened to all this and could not believe his ears. Then she asked him that if he had free time, would he go with her? The hero had no choice but to agree. They arrived at a shopping center where they sell clothes, silks, and ties. When they entered the store, they were greeted by the salesman. The girl told him to show him the ties. A couple of minutes later, the seller brought her a white tie with a ruby stone. The girl took it in her hands and looked at it, then said that at the same time she wanted to give a gift to Count Elliot, and asked Brooks because he has good taste if he would help her choose a gift. The hero looked at his wife dissatisfied and then said, Okay, it's not difficult for him. Claire then asked the salesperson to show her something more colorful and that she wanted something that would stand out. Brooks thought with indignation that she wanted to give Elliot something special. The seller brought the girl a purple tie and she was delighted, said how beautiful it was and the color was very beautiful, but thought to herself that a purple one should suit the marquee. 
She then asked Brooks if he would try on the tie, and he asked her if it was a gift for Elliot. But he had no choice but to agree. She put a tie around his neck and asked him to bow his head. Otherwise, he was so tall. That's what the guy asked and tilted his head lower. The girl tied her tie and said everything is ready. Now you can stand up straight. Brooks stood straight with a straight face. Meanwhile, Claire and the seller looked at him with delight and admiration. The seller noticed that this is a rather flashy color, but it looks simply stunning on the Marquise, and the heroine said that it really suits him. And then I asked the Marquis Lawrence what he thought about the tie. He thought about how he didn't think it would suit Elliot's simple appearance. But he eventually told the girl that the scarf looked very good. Claire said great and asked the seller to pack this tie for her. The seller said okay, wait a little. Brooks thought to himself that he hadn't lied because he hadn't said who exactly the tie would look good on. While they waited for the gift to be wrapped, the girl gave Brooks hats to try on, one by one. She then helped him try on different shoes. Finally, they left the mall, and the girl said with a smile that she had bought so many beautiful jewelry, and Brooks was walking behind with the boxes, a little dissatisfied. And he asked her if it was too much. She replied that it was quite a bit compared to how much money was spent on the last dance evening. Claire asked him if he didn't usually spend that much money. He didn't know what to answer and just remained silent. But I thought to myself that a dress for my wife and a gift for Elliot were completely different things. The heroine said that she seemed to have bought everything she wanted so they can return. Good idea, the guy said, and they headed towards the carriage. The girl thought that Brooks seemed to have not figured out her plan. She looked at him and thought that today was April 1st, Brooks' birthday. The hero extended his hand to her and said with a smile, Mrs. Let's Go Home. Claire smiled back at the Marquis, extended her hand, and said okay. That same evening, the girl knocked on Brooks's office. He was sitting and studying some papers. When Claire came to see him, she asked him if he could spare her a minute. He stood up and said, of course, how can he not give time to his wife, and asked if something had happened. The heroine began to say that this was the case, and suddenly said that for this she needed a place where there was no light. And Claire asked the Marquis if he could go with her to the garden. At first he was a little surprised, then, smiling, he said that he would take her to a better place. Brooks snapped his fingers and a glow swirled around them and a portal appeared. And a moment later they found themselves in some kind of garden. Claire opened her mouth in surprise. After the glow disappeared and the portal, the girl asked him where they ended up. The hero answered her that this is the Richmond Forest in the Imperial Palace. No one comes here, so it is quiet and dark here. And he added that no one would know that they were here now. Then he asked what the heroine wanted to talk to him about. The girl gathered her courage and said that she would like to give him something. And she handed him a huge, precious blue stone that looked like a diamond. What is this? Is it really some kind of magic stone? Brooks thought to himself. The heroine continued to hold this stone in her hands and water seemed to be swirling around it. Then she called Vodin. He appeared and hung over the stone and some miracle began to happen. The stone hung over Claire's hands and began to turn into something else. And after a few moments, the stone turned into an unusual shape in the form of a crystal flower. Brooks opened his mouth in surprise and looked at this whole miracle without taking his eyes off. All he did was watch and couldn't say anything else. Then the girl handed him this crystal flower and said that it was his birthday present. Congratulations on your birthday, Claire said. And the Marquis was unexpectedly surprised and asked what it was and how. She asked him if he didn't fully understand what was happening because today was his birthday. The heroine then said that all the gifts she bought today were actually meant for him. Brooks was dumbfounded, but she continued and asked if he thought she would ask him to try on a gift for someone else. The hero smiled and said that he had completely forgotten about it, and she managed to fool him. The Marquis held his gift in his hands and said that it was a very beautiful flower. The girl began to say that she studied hard and even asked the servant Mason to help her, and she was very glad that everything worked out in the end. The heroine then told Brooks that the ice flower would soon melt, but she hoped it would bring him joy. The Marquis told her that he would enchant the flower with his magic and keep it forever. The girl said that she was proud that she had such a talented husband, and he said that he was very glad that he had such a wonderful wife who took care of his birthday. She smiled at him and said that she was glad that he liked the gift. She also wanted to please him. After all, you prepared my last birthday, thank you, Claire said. Brooks asked the girl if he could ask a question as a birthday boy. The girl looked at him in surprise and said, okay, ask. And the Marquis decided to ask Claire why she loved Tom Reacher. The heroine did not expect such a question and did not know how to answer him. 
Brooks apologized for asking such a rude question. Then Claire did respond, saying that it was just like that there was no particular reason. She said that since childhood she wanted to have a good family, and Tom seemed constant and responsible. That's why I chose him, that's all, the heroine finished. Brooks was silent, thought about something for a bit, then asked the girl if she still loved Tom Reacher. Claire did not look at Brooks, but talked to him with her back to him, and said that she had not liked Tom for a long time. She could not even remember when she stopped loving him. Then the girl turned to him and asked with a smile why he suddenly decided to ask about this. Because you are my wife, the hero answered her without thinking. Claire looked into the Marquise's eyes, then lowered her head and was silent. And then Brooks, after a short silence, told the girl that it was despondency. Through despondency, you can summon the water spirit, Voden, the hero continued. The guy asked the girl if he could ask what kind of despondency she felt, and I, dear YouTube viewers, want to ask you about your impressions, about this video, which you can leave in the comments. The heroine turned away from him and said, no, don't ask about that. Brooks lowered his head and said, okay. Claire didn't understand why, when suddenly the conversation turned to Tom Reacher. The hero then asked if the Marquis could then ask another question. She said that he only wanted to ask one question. Brooks replied that this time the question would really be the last, and the girl agreed. The Marquis began to say that the question would be quite simple, and this. But then the heroine interrupted him and kissed Brooks on the lips. The hero opened his eyes in surprise and was a little shocked. After the kiss, the Marquis came to his senses a little and asked Claire how she could do this. Do you mean how I realized that you were going to kiss me? The girl asked him. By your eyes, Claire answered. Because your facial expression changes when you are about to play with me. Brooks didn't expect this answer and asked how to play it. He frowned, grabbed the heroine by the hands and said that he would now do something that she did not expect. And then he warned her that now he was not playing with her at all. How suddenly Brooks kissed Claire and hugged her tightly. The girl did not expect this from him. And they stood like that for a long time, hugging each other and kissing passionately. At the mansion, Bronson, Samantha, and her mother were discussing Tom Reacher. Samantha began to say that the priests and doctors said that they did not know the cause of Reacher's illness. She continued by saying that his body was fine, but he wasn't waking up and she didn't know what she could do to help him. The mother held her daughter's hand supporting her, but suddenly her face changed. And the mother suddenly let go of her daughter's hand and got up from the chair. She said, displeasedly, that now they would have problems, since this engagement had been approved by the Empress herself. Samantha was silent and bowed her head. Then her mother began to continue and told her that for now she should be next to Tom Reacher. She must show everyone what a faithful bride she is. Then she sternly said that if this doesn't work, then she will come up with something else, do you understand me? She asked her daughter, and Samantha answered her, Yes, Mom. Lawrence Mansion, servant Mason reports to Brooks. Mason said there was a recording of the conversation with the first prince, and added that he had received the original copy of the conversation. The Marquis thought a little and said okay in order to continue preparing. In a year or two, they should finish everything. The servant said that they also found a woman similar to Madame. Mason continued that, in appearance and age, Viscountess Felgeris is very similar to Madame. She has no family, so they quickly organize everything. Brooks asked the servant if Felgeris was far from Solaris. The Marquis began to think that, on the other hand, Claire could become free if she left this place and changed her name. The servant asked the master why he was wondering if he was not sure because of Madame. What are you talking about, asked Mason's hero. And he yelled at the servant to stop talking nonsense and get out of here. Mason said yes, sir, bowed before him and left the office. As soon as the servant left, Brooks leaned back and sighed heavily. He thought about how he would destroy the Bronson family as planned. And what will be the expression on Claire's face when she sees him in this guise? No, he told himself. By that time, she would no longer be Claire Bronson or Claire Lawrence. By that time, she would be called Bella. Will she be angry with me? The hero asked himself. On a sunny morning, Claire sat in the garden and had breakfast alone. The heroine began to remember her kiss with Brooks again and again. Why do I remember that day? The heroine thought and suddenly dropped her cup of hot tea. Eh, the girl shouted and jumped away from the table in fright. The maid was also afraid for Madame and asked Madame if she was okay. Claire replied that she was fine, and the maid said that she would quickly bring everything needed for cleaning. When the maid left, Claire began to wonder what was happening to her. The heroine again began to remember her kiss with Brooks. Then the girl told herself that no, it was all an illusion. The one who plans to kill her in the future 
and the one who married her due to his goal of killing the Bronson family. Knowing all this, the heroine, for some reason, still feels such awe towards him. In a few months, Brooks would destroy the Bronson family, and he would eventually kill her, too. And Claire shouldn't fall in love with such a person, she shouldn't. But why doesn't her heart listen to her? At the Spring Mansion, Charlotte asks the Marquis of Spring if he wants to become Duke of Spring. He stood facing the window and answered yes, because all this time Spring had the status of Marquis. Then he turned to her and said that now, after this long humiliation, she didn't think it was time for them to act. Charlotte replied that if they use Lawrence to get rid of Bronson, then Lawrence will only become stronger. Marcus Spring told her that he had a guarantee that Lawrence would then face defeat. After a short silence, Charlotte asked about Myrtle Sanchez if they could trust the words of a woman whose origin they did not even know. Marquis Spring looked at her and said that Charlotte was too young to deal with this problem. She got angry and turned away and told him that she understood, asked for forgiveness and said that it was time for her to go. Marquis Spring didn't say anything to her, just looked after her and smiled slightly. Charlotte left the room and was beside herself with anger and said how much longer he would ignore her. Then the maid suddenly came up to her and said that it seemed like something bad had happened. The maid came closer and said Charlotte Spring with a smile, and she looked at her and also said her name Myrtle Sanchez. Charlotte came closer to Myrtle and told her not to be so presumptuous. She was just a servant. As Charlotte Spring began to walk away, Myrtle said after her that Emily Smith did not die of a heart attack. Miss Spring turned to her and looked at her in surprise, and she continued that Emily had in fact been killed. And soon Mrs. Lawrence will be in danger, Myrtle Sanchez said. Charlotte couldn't believe it and asked about Emily if she had really been killed. The maid was about to leave about her business, but Charlotte detained her too and asked how she could believe her words. Myrtle replied that she could believe if she wanted or not. It was her will. Charlotte got furious and told her not to think that it was so easy with her. I'm not like my father, Charlotte Spring shouted and left. Myrtle stayed and began to tell herself that she thought it would be very easy. Ellis Engels came to visit the main character at the mansion of the Marquis Lawrence. She bowed before the lady and said that from today she would join Lawrence's first squad. Hello, madam, said Ellis, and the girl replied that she hoped she would be a loyal knight. Claire said she was surprised by her sudden greeting. Ellis replied that she just wanted to tell her that she had been officially knighted. Then she added that she would now use respectful speech and address her as a lady while on duty, and after work they would communicate as friends. Okay, the girl said, and thought that Ellis became a knight. Then the heroine decided to ask, they also have knights, why she decided to go here to them. Ellis didn't expect such a question, then answered that Elle actually doesn't like it when she holds a sword in her hands. She continued the story that their late father was not a good man. After the death of their mother, their father squandered his wealth and became cruel to the servants and Elle. Thanks to him, Ellis said, her father never hit her. Then she learned fencing to show her father that he was wrong. But one day our father disappeared, Ellis said, and she didn't even have time to prove anything to him. Claire looked at her with pity, and Ellis said that it was a little unfortunate, but she felt relieved now. The heroine listened to her story and only spoke clearly. Ellis said Elle thinks knighthood is the reason she gave up all her future plans, but she actually enjoys fencing. The girl smiled at her and said that it means she has found her true path. Honestly, I wanted to apologize to you. Ellis suddenly said. Claire looked at her carefully and waited for what she would say. Ellis said that she actually became close to Claire because of her father. The heroine looked at Ellis in surprise, and she said that her father had disappeared for some time. Then she continued that, ten years after his disappearance, he was officially declared dead. Ellis clenched her fists and told Claire that she herself had thought about killing him. But someone told me that someone wanted to kill my father before me, and I wanted to make sure if it was true that my father died and for what reason, she said. After the story, Ellis smiled after drinking tea and told Claire that she was not offended by the Marquis because he killed his father. Rather, she would like to thank him, because she's not sure she could do it herself, and if she was standing in front of her father. But then the heroine called her and looked at her with pity. Ellis smiled at her and said that she had wanted to tell her this all along, that she started talking to her because of her ulterior motives, then she raised her head and asked Claire if, after all this, she would be her friend. Of course I will, the heroine answered and smiled back at her. Alice was very happy with her answer, but then Claire said something that shocked her, that she would have become friends with Ellis even if her intention was to kill Claire. What are you saying? Ellis asked her, and the girl replied that she seemed to feel guilty for trying to kill her father. 
But I'm not much different from you. I don't care about the well-being of my family, the heroine said. Then she looked into Ellis's eyes and told her that that's why she, too, considers herself irresponsible. Ellis told her not to talk like that to herself. The heroine replied that that's why she absolutely doesn't care about it and she's talking seriously. Miss Engels said she seemed to be worried for nothing and put her hand in her pocket, and she pulled out a sealed envelope on the table. The heroine asked her what it was. Was it really an invitation letter? Ellis said Ellie's succession ceremony will take place in three days. God, the girl said this so unexpectedly and began to read the invitation. Ellis said that because of her worries about her father, she still could not decide to invite her. Will you come? She asked Claire. The girl looked and read the invitation. After thinking a little, she said that she would come. In the evening, the heroine told Brooks that she was invited to the Engels mansion. In three days, this is very unexpected. We don't have much time left, the hero said. Claire told him that if he was busy, she could go alone, but Brooks said no. He said so because he felt that they would not have enough time to choose a dress. The girl objected, saying that she didn't actually need to buy a dress. She had a lot of dresses that she hadn't worn yet, and she also had jewelry. But the hero told her no. She would need to find something new here. Then he said that he would pick her up something, and she agreed. The heroine looked at her husband with a smile and thought that this man was simply impossible to stop. Engels County, the day of Elliot Engels' succession ceremony, has finally arrived. Brooks and Claire entered the room wearing beautiful purple outfits that were very color-matching to each other. The Marquis and Marchioness Lawrence. Welcome here, the butler said and greeted them. The hero looked around and said that there were not many people at the ceremony, and the girl said that it seemed that only relatives and close people were invited. The Marquise and Marquise Lawrence called and L. Engels approached them. He greeted them and thanked them for coming today. The heroine smiled and said that they were the ones who were grateful for inviting them. And Brooks kept thinking about L. Engels. It seemed to him that he was somehow strange. Wait, I'm here too. Ellis ran up to them with a smile and hugged her brother from behind. Thank you for coming, Ellis said. And Claire told her that she thanked her for the invitation and complimented her on how good they looked. Ellis then said goodbye to them and said that she would like to talk some more, but she needed to say hello to everyone else. Then we will go, Elle said. When they left, Brooks indignantly said why the subordinate could not have a normal conversation with his superiors. Claire told him that now was not the right time. And she said that at the moment, Ellis is not a Lawrence Knight, but a member of the Engels family. Then the waiter approached them with champagne and the girl took two glasses. Then she turned to Brooks and said with a smile that this would not work. They would not bother the Count and Ellis, but would just have a good time. The Marquis agreed with her and said it was a good idea. The succession ceremony began and a special speech was made. The new Earl formally assumes his new responsibilities and obligations to his people and family. Count Engels receives a medal symbolizing his new position and power. Ellis looked at him with pride and clapped her hands. She was very happy for her brother. All the guests clapped and congratulated Count L. Engels on his new position. Brooks and Claire went out onto the balcony to get some fresh air, and suddenly the hero asks his wife that Count L is very handsome, isn't he? The heroine did not expect such a question and did not immediately know how to answer him. Then after thinking, she said that today they stand out with their outfits. The Marquis asked her what she was saying because that was not what he meant. Then the girl said that it seemed that she and Brooks had different opinions. She must have strange taste. Taste asked her boyfriend, not understanding what she wanted to say by this. And the heroine continued that because, for her, there is a person who is more beautiful than Count Engels. Brooks didn't fully understand and started looking around, then said, Wait, who is this person? And Claire laughed and said, Who does he want to find here? And she continued to say that this man was standing in front of her now. She was talking about him. The hero was stunned and opened his mouth, then smiled at her. Then he told the girl that she had good taste, very refined taste. Look at this face, is there even one flaw in it? Brooks asked her. She replied that yes there is, it's your character. And the Marquis told her that she caught him. He's not very good at mental or healing magic, but that doesn't mean he can't use them. The girl said she didn't mean it, and Brooks coughed and said he understood. And then he asked her if it means she likes his appearance more than the appearance of Count Engels. The heroine smiled at him and asked if it means he is now done with his jokes. He suddenly changed his face and then said to her, does she think that he does everything for fun? Claire did not understand why he was suddenly indignant and told him that he had just been joking. The guy told her that he was sincerely glad that he was her type and he wanted her to know it. 
The girl asked him what they were talking about now about her taste and who he liked better in appearance. Do you know who ranks second in beauty? The Marquis asked her. The heroine was surprised by this question and asked the second place in beauty. The Marquis pointed to himself with a smile and said it to me, and the girl thought how shameless he was. Then the hero bent down and kissed her hand, and raising his head he told her that a more beautiful person than him was now in front of him. The girl blushed and said that she was glad that there was no one else here except them. Brooks said he could say it in front of everyone if she wanted. Claire replied, no, she doesn't want to, she doesn't need to do this really, and he laughed in response. Then the girl asked him if it was his hobby to make fun of her. The Marquis looked at her and said that she was right since he got married, his life has become much brighter. The way she gets cutely angry and laughs with her, he really likes it. The heroine just said his name, Brooks, when they immediately merged in a passionate kiss. But suddenly a maid came in and said that the banquet was about to begin and they had to go. And the maid seeing them kissing said oh and froze with shame. The heroine smiled and told her that they would be there soon. Then she turned to the Marquis and said, Let's go. By the way, I forgot to ask you a question. Brooke suddenly said and asked if she liked the new dress. She answered yes with a smile, it's just wonderful. The hero proudly said that he was very glad that she liked the dress. In the hall, the tables were already set, but the guests had not yet sat down. Ellis came up to them with some girl and said, here you are. Ellis then said she wanted to introduce someone to her. Miss Greta, say hello, Miss Engels said to the girl. I am Greta from the family of Viscount Francis. I am glad to welcome you, she said. But then the maid called her and Greta asked for forgiveness that she had to go and apologized again for being rude. Claire told her that everything was fine. They would see each other again. Miss is so good, isn't she? Asked Brooks and Claire Ellis. They didn't answer, but she continued saying that Greta was a little busy today and had a lot of people to greet. Then Miss Engels turned to them and said that they were soon to be married. Claire and Brooks were shocked by this statement, and the hero told Ellis that he congratulated her and that he would need to prepare the knights to sing the anthem at the wedding. But now Ellis was in shock and asked what he was saying. Then Claire intervened in the conversation and told her that she didn't know what to say, but if it was her choice, then she would always support her. Ellis suddenly screamed, asking them what they were just thinking. It wasn't about me, it was my brother L who would soon marry Greta, Ellis said. Brooks and Claire felt a little awkward, and the heroine simply replied, Ah, understandable. Suddenly, the Marquis asked Ellis if Count Engels had a fiancé. Ellis answered yes, and said that they had even attended a hunting competition together, and asked if he had not seen them then. The hero couldn't believe it. They were together, even at hunting competitions, but he didn't see them, and his assistant Will had to tell him about it. And then Brooks realized that Will had deliberately not told him about it, and Claire and Ellis were looking at him in surprise. Then Miss Engels told him that he didn't seem to know that his brother had a fiancé. Ellis thought it was working out. In the end, Brooks was still worried about L, which means he was jealous. It seems that the Marquis loves Claire very much, Ellis thought and looked at him. Then she wondered why Mrs. Lawrence didn't believe him. Late that evening, Brooks Lawrence sat in his office waiting for Will. When the assistant entered the office, the gentleman asked him with a false smile if he knew why Brooks had called him. The assistant hesitated, did not know what to say, and thought to himself that there could actually be many reasons. And the Marquis told him with a mysterious smile that Count L. Engels would soon get married. So that's it. This is very good news, Will said, and added that it means they should pick up a gift in his name. But the hero interrupted him and asked why he did not report this to him, because the assistant knew how worried he was about this, didn't he? Will was a little scared by his tone and said that he was going to tell him everything. Brooks was silent, and the assistant thought that what he really wanted was to see the distraught gentleman suffer from his jealousy, but he could not tell the truth, because then he would cut his throat. So you were going to tell me everything, the hero asked furiously. Will replied that yes, exactly. Every time he was going to tell him about it, the gentleman interrupted him, then got angry and left in anger. Then the assistant began to complain that this was impossible. If he did not listen to his subordinates, he would be called a dictator. Brooks listened silently, and Will ended by saying that Madame might not like it. Why are you suddenly talking about Claire? The Marquis asked the assistant, and he replied that who would like the fact that he expresses everything, but does not listen to others. And he also said that now he only behaves this way with his subordinates, but if he doesn't change anything, then in the future it will spread to his friends and family. Brooks thought for a bit, 
and then said that he remembered how many times he tried to tell him something. And Will, standing behind the gentleman, clenched his fist and thought it worked. Are you really going to tell me about this? The Marquis asked, and the assistant answered, Of course, who would want him to be jealous, that is, to do extra work? Brooks looked at him, then closed his eyes and said, Okay, I'll believe you. The assistant smiled at him and said thank you very much. Then he suddenly exploded and asked the gentleman if he really thought that he would say that to him, because he called him at such a late time, also just because he could treat his subordinates like that, and said that he should apologize to him. Brooks listened to him and told him that he would increase his salary by 20%, and next month he would receive a bonus in the form of one and a half thousand gold pieces. Will began to thank him and said that as a faithful servant he would serve him even more faithfully. One day Claire was sitting in her room reading a book and drinking tea. Suddenly a maid knocked on her door and said that a guest had come to see Madame. At such a late hour, I wonder who came, her heroine asked. The maid said that Tom Reacher had come to see her. Claire was a little shocked and wondered why Tom came to her. Tom sat opposite the heroine on the sofa and recalled his childhood. He stands and looks at the bed where his mother lies. The doctors shout that the bleeding does not stop. Quickly bring hot water, but it is too late. The child survived, but the mother died. Little Tom looks on with tears in his eyes and cannot believe it. Then Tom's father comes in and shouts, Wife, what happened? How could this happen? His mother died after giving birth. He was then four years old. He saw his mother lying bleeding, and little Tom's father and the servants cried bitterly he was very young then and did not understand what was really happening. He saw his newborn brother cry, and from that day his world changed completely. After Tom's mother passed away, his father inherited the Reacher family title. Little Tom decided to go into the garden and talk to his father, but he could not overcome some fear within himself. And just as he was about to leave, his father called him and told him that he did not want to become a duke. When Tom turned to face him, his father continued that he should not be ashamed of being the heir to the Reacher family title and told him to try to become the head of the family. Then after a short pause, he told his son that he would only need to do this. Little Tom, leaving him, thought how helpless and indifferent his father was he had never been close to him. And Tom doesn't love the newborn child because he killed his mother. The Reacher family now existed only in photographs. And this portrait of his mother, he doesn't remember his mother's face, but that's okay because here he can see her in the portrait. Three years later, at one of the gala balls, little Tom was introduced to Claire Bronson. He was told that little Claire, like him, belongs to the Duke's family, so they think that they will get along. When the girl raised her head and looked at him, and Tom saw her face, he was simply amazed. She reminded him of his mother. He then smiled at her, extended his hand and said hi to Claire, let's be friends. The girl said okay, and extended her hand in response. Little Tom thought about her and called her a beautiful girl who looks like her mother. He told himself that he would like this child to be with her, because thanks to her it seemed to him that his mother was nearby. You are very beautiful, Tom said. She thanked him and blushed a little. But then he suddenly told her that her clothes were too bright and did not suit her. The girl was surprised by this statement and said that she liked her dress. But he objected, saying that he didn't like it. She looked good in ordinary clothes without any decorations. Tom pointed to a woman in simple clothes who looked like a maid standing nearby and told Claire that this was a good example. Claire said that she thought these clothes were very simple, but suddenly little Tom asked her if she really meant to say that she did not agree with her friend. The girl hastened to answer him that she would wear what Tom said. After these words, the boy calmed down and smiled and thanked her. Look there, there is a boy from the Reacher family and a girl from the Bronson family, talking and standing together, they look so good, said the other girls who were looking at them. Tom and Claire were together throughout their childhood, studying, playing, reading, and were always close. And even when they became adults, they were always there for each other. One day, Tom came to Claire while she was sitting on a bench reading a book. The guy said he loved her and he would like them to become a couple. The girl suddenly became sad and told him that he wanted to deprive her of her only friend. She did not accept his offer, refused him, and left. And Tom simply did not expect this from her. But he didn't give up. A year later, he tried again, and finally Claire accepted his feelings. When they hugged, he proposed to her and said, let's get married, and she agreed. As a result, he and the heroine got engaged, and everything went smoothly for them. Tom seemed to calm down, too. But suddenly, he began to doubt whether this was true love between a man and a woman. And around the same time Samantha appeared, Tom met her for the first time. 
Present time, Claire and Tom sat opposite each other and were silent. The heroine was thinking about Tom because she had not heard anything about him since he lost consciousness. I wonder when he came to his senses. And why did he suddenly decide to come to her? What was the matter? Claire finally told him that if he had something important, he should speak quickly and come back. She had no desire to drag out the conversation with him. Tom suddenly became furious and said that her words were too harsh. Wasn't she glad to see him? The heroine asked him why she should be happy. Now he is Samantha's fiancé. From now on, he and Claire are no longer friends, and there is no relationship between them. And she added that this is why she does not want to meet with him in an informal setting and hopes that this will not happen again in the future. Tom said that he thought he would apologize to her for having to break off the engagement, and he knows that she resents him for betraying her and choosing to be with Samantha. But listen to me, please. Tom suddenly shouted and told her that she should divorce Marcus Brooks Lawrence. Claire was shocked and got up from the sofa and told him, what are you talking about? He clenched his fist and said that he didn't understand everything yet and didn't even know how best to talk about it. He had returned from the future. Let me introduce myself. I'm Claire's younger sister. My name is Samantha, the girl told Reacher. After he met her for the first time in his life, he felt what love was. And then Tom realized that his relationship with Claire was not love at all. He mistook friendship for love. Reacher sat in his office and thought about Samantha, why he only met her after his engagement to Claire. That golden hair that Claire doesn't have, that beautiful dress and that shy smile like a spring flower, he really likes it all. And Tom wants it all to be his to have Samantha, but he can't afford to break off his engagement to Claire. After the breakdown of the marriage, he doesn't even want to think about how she will move away from him, or even leave. Claire should always be by his side, no matter what, because she replaces his mother, because she is his family. Therefore, it is necessary to make sure that she is the first to dissolve the marriage, but contrary to his wishes, the wedding is not canceled. Claire asked Reacher how he liked her dress for the banquet, whether it was too simple. He was silent and thought about something of his own, without even listening to her, and then she said, Absolutely. You don't like flashy dresses. Then she thought that it might be too modest for a banquet, and asked him what he thought he liked better. Reacher didn't hear her, and the heroine called him loudly again, and he finally looked at her. She asked if he was listening to what she said. She asked which dress suited her best. Tom told her to wear what she usually wears, something modest. There is no need to wear something flashy because of some banquet. And he told her to stop asking him stupid questions. Claire answered well. She put on something simple, as Tom said. They sat together at the banquet and looked at the beautiful and radiant Samantha. Time passed, he was still Claire's husband, and Samantha became Brooks Lawrence's wife. Tom was drinking alcohol endlessly, and Claire came up to him and told him to stop drinking. Why are you drinking, she asked. But suddenly he yelled at her and told her to leave him alone, as she could nag him already on their wedding night. Now I am your husband and all you have to do is obey my words, Tom told her. And he shouted that she should not touch him unnecessarily, and Claire only quietly answered, Yes, okay. Tom sat down on the chair and said, Damn, it's all because of Claire. It's because of her that he can't be with Samantha. Claire is to blame for this, who insisted on marriage. She knows how he feels for Samantha. Over time, Tom's dissatisfaction only grew. It was unbearably painful for him to realize that Samantha had left for someone else before he tried to woo her. And one day, the news came that Samantha was dead. Tom yelled at Claire that it was all her fault, and it was all because she refused to marry Lawrence. And if it weren't for her, now this innocent girl would be in his arms. It's all Claire Bronson's fault. Samantha died because of her. It rained that day. He remembers everything he said to Claire that day. And all that resentment and anger, he remembers all this perfectly. But most importantly, he never apologized to Claire. A girl very similar to Samantha told Reacher that this woman was not guilty of anything. It was Brooks Lawrence who destroyed Bronson, and Mrs. was just lucky to survive. Wasn't that what the girl asked Tom? He looked at her and asked what she meant. It was his fault, she replied that of course not. The girl said that it was Lawrence's fault, but several years had already passed, so she asked him to relax. He had suffered enough during all this time. Tom smiled and said that she was lucky that she looked like Samantha. If it was anyone else, he would have already kicked her out of the room. She was delighted at his words and said how lucky she was and offered to console him. Tom didn't feel guilty about being with a woman like Samantha, but Claire soon found out about it. It was very difficult for him then, and he believed that she should suffer too, 
because Claire should feel guilty for Samantha's death. The main character stood at the window and asked the maid, Tom will come again late today. The maid was silent, and the girl said that she understood everything. But Claire, despite what Tom did, always remained nearby, as did the portrait of his mother hanging on the wall near the stairs on the second floor. The heroine was always by Tom's side, no matter what, and replaced his late mother. But one rainy night, Claire suddenly committed suicide. Our days, Assistant Will came running to Mr. Brooks Lawrence out of breath, and he told him where he was. Otherwise, he was looking for him everywhere. The Marquis did not show it and continued to straighten his suit, then asked why he shouted so much what happened there. Assistant Will told him that Tom Reacher had arrived at the mansion and that Madame was now communicating with him. Brooks became furious and started yelling at Will, telling him how he could have let an intruder in and asked him that he had decided to die for dereliction of duty. The assistant said that as far as he knew, Reacher got in by overpowering their men. The soldiers, fearing the consequences, did not dare to stop the heir to the title of Duke of the Richer family. And in the end, Madam told Tom to come in. Assistant Will finished his story. Brooks looked at him angrily, and he said that Madame had a couple of secret escorts, so he didn't think that her life was in danger right now. Is there no threat now? The Marquis asked and put on his jacket, then said that he himself would take full responsibility. The hero snapped his fingers and called a teleport and disappeared from the room in an instant. Rushed quickly like lightning, Will said, then told the other assistant that he was worried that Tom Reacher's skills had suddenly improved. The second mate told him that even if Tom died a hundred times and was reborn again, he could never compare with the Marquis. Tom Reacher sat in front of Claire and looked at her intently and thought that it was really her, she didn't die. His Claire was alive just like six years ago. He thought that Brooks Lawrence used magic at that time, and the magic must have worked on Tom, and he returned to the past. But Reacher wondered why Claire decided to marry Marquis Lawrence this time, because Samantha had originally married him, something went wrong. The heroine asked him that he thought that she would divorce without hesitation if he only demanded it, and she also asked him to tell her why he wanted her to divorce Marcus Lawrence. Tom, after thinking a little, told her that this was because the Marquis would make her unhappy, the girl asked him why, and he replied that because he did not marry her for love. At first, the heroine, after listening to him, fell into a kind of stupor, but after a few seconds she burst out laughing and could not stop. He asked her what was funny about what he said, and she replied that after a long time, he just decided to tell her this. Claire looked at him and told him that not everyone marries for love, like he and Samantha. Many nobles enter into arranged marriages, so don't bother me any more about this topic, she continued. Tom could not say anything, but only listened to her with incomprehension, and she asked him if that was all he wanted to talk about. If so, then let him return. No matter how she lived, it had nothing to do with him. Reacher got angry, got up and started shouting that this affected him too. The girl told him to get away from her. Tom kept shouting that she wasn't like this before. She always smiled tenderly at him and spoke to him in a soft tone and he told her that she had never been as cold as she is now. Why is she now not the same as before? Why has she changed? The girl answered him that yes, she had changed, but his feelings had also changed. Why then couldn't she change? Tom told her that he had apologized to her for being with Samantha, and he regretted it. Claire said she didn't want to hear it and didn't want to see him anymore and told him to get out of there. But Reacher did not let up and said that he would not leave like that, would not let her go, and grabbed her hands tightly. Then he told her that Brooks Lawrence did not have any pure intentions towards her. He was the illegitimate son of the past emperor, and no matter how worthy a person he was, he could not immediately receive the status of a marquis. The emperor took care of that. Tom continued to hold her hands and said that he was just pretending to be a commoner, and working his way into the aristocracy, he married her because he needed to use the Bronson family. The heroine listened to him and asked how he knew about this, he replied that he is Reacher's successor and His Majesty's closest assistant, so he knows a lot of things. And he began to think to himself that he would like to say now that he knows the future, but he cannot. How will he say that it was because of him that Claire died? Reacher continued to yell at the heroine to trust him because Brooks was using her. He is only kind to you because he wants to improve relations with Bronson. The Marquis does not love you. And when he gets what he wants, he will kill you. Reacher told her. 
The girl looked at him, and he said that this is why she should not be with the Marquis. Do you think I don't know this? Claire asked him and said that she got married already knowing about it. Tom was furious and couldn't believe it, and asked her what she was saying, did she really know that Marquis Lawrence was the Emperor's illegitimate son? Reacher could not calm down and began to shake Claire more and more. She asked him to let her go, and at that very moment, Brooks Lawrence suddenly burst in. Tom Reacher immediately released Claire and said, Marquis Lawrence and Brooks interrupted him and said that he had not yet received the corresponding title, but already dared to burst in here. Brooks walked up to Tom and grabbed him by the collar out of anger and lifted him up, and Reacher hardly asked him what he was doing. The Marquis said that, depending on his behavior, this was the last time he could easily visit them, but if he liked today's reception, he could come to them again. And with an ominous smile, he said that now he would show what would happen to him. Suddenly something crunched. The girl was in shock. Tom began to scream furiously in pain. Brooks told him that he wanted to break his neck, but he had to make do with his shoulder and let him thank his last name, Reacher. When Tom sat down on the floor in pain, the Marquis asked if he had a wedding soon and said to go back to his place so as not to be late for it and added that he felt sorry for his bride. Reacher tried to get up and shouted at him, you, Lawrence, and wanted to say something else, but Brooks interrupted him and he said, okay, it's none of my business anyway and wished him a good trip back. Then the Marquis conjured a portal, the whole room lit up and Reacher immediately disappeared. The girl opened her mouth in surprise and told the Marquis that Tom had disappeared in an instant. Brooks asked her if she was hurt. Claire replied that she was fine. The Marquis looked at her wrists and saw the marks and bruises that Tom had left and told her that she was not okay. The girl told him that the wound would soon go away so that he wouldn't worry. Brooks told her that all wounds in this world go away over time, or rather, their visible part goes away. The guy looked at her and asked if she would allow him to cure her, and the heroine agreed. After a few minutes, he said that was it. There were no traces left, and he was very glad that the potion helped. The heroine thanked him, then lowered her head and thought. Claire began to remember Tom Reacher, how he held her hands, shook her with all his might, and how it hurt her. Suddenly, the Marquis told the girl that he would like to ask her for something. Then he took and kissed her hand and said that he wanted her to appreciate her body. She should take care of herself appreciating her as if she were the most valuable diamond in this world. He would really like that. The heroine wanted to tell him something, but he interrupted her and said that if someone behaves badly towards her, then let her get angry, swear and break ties with this person. And he added that she should never tolerate such treatment again. Claire looked at him gratefully, then lowered her head and said, okay. Half an hour later, they were sitting and drinking wine. Brooks asked her if Tom had told him anything about him. The heroine answered yes, this was what was discussed. He said that the Marquis was the illegitimate son of the Emperor. The guy looked at her but didn't say anything, and then she told him that she didn't know how Reacher knew about it. Then she said that if he didn't want her to talk about it, he could kill her. Brooks was surprised by this statement and asked her not to say such terrible things. She apologized and said that it was just a joke. I can't laugh at such a joke, he said, folding his arms over his chest. Then he began his story saying that he didn't even know where to start. But then he decided to start about his mother, that she was a servant of the Imperial Palace. As far as he knows, his mother entered the palace because she wanted to avoid an unwanted marriage. However, later, thanks to her outstanding appearance, the Emperor noticed her. And just like that, after a while he appeared Little Brooks. They did not plan his birth, but the Emperor and his mother loved him very much. However, then trouble happened to them when he was born. His mother and the Emperor were poisoned. The Empress must have been behind this. She was worried about the fact that they had me. The Marquis continued his story. The hero said with a smile that he was very lucky, and in the end he survived. But he cannot say that he was always lucky, because after that Count Engels took him and sold him to the slave trading guilds. However, thanks to this, he was able to escape the persecution of the Empress, so we can say that he was lucky. The girl told him that it meant that he was the first to discover his mother's body. It must have shocked him greatly because he was at such a young age. Brooks answered yes. He was 15 at the time, and the memories of that day haunted him for a long time. He especially hated the smell of mint because it reminded him of his mother's lifeless body. Because she died because of mint tea, which contained poison. The heroine wanted to somehow calm him down, say something to console him, but the Marquis told her not to worry so much. 
because then I decided to overcome my trauma over the smell of peppermint, and now everything is fine, Brooks said with a smile. The girl listened to him in amazement and said that he was simply incredible. She, in turn, always avoids what she doesn't like. She told him that she was not as strong as him. Wherever she went, she wore something simple and behaved as inconspicuously as possible. The same goes for her family. To avoid being hated, it is better to do nothing, so Claire tried to make herself loved, but she gave up in advance. Then she laughed and said that after hearing his story, she realized that she was wrong. The Marquis answered her that she was not wrong, she was just a different person. She smiled and answered him, and laid her head on his shoulder, and they sat like that for the rest of the evening. Brooks Lawrence sat in his office at his desk, thinking, while heavy rain fell outside the window. He thought that in the end their conversation led nowhere. Now Claire knows that he is an illegitimate son, and how much she still knows. Does she know that Bronson is his enemy, unfortunately? He never asked anything. The Marcus leaned back in his chair and said that when he sees Claire, he cannot utter a word. He doesn't want to see her sad, and doesn't want to tell her anything that might upset her. And the reason why he behaves this way with her is perhaps because he fell silent and did not speak further. Then he turned to Chloe and asked her if she knew this would happen, and so she asked him to make a promise. Chloe told him that he had to kill Bronson, then this child would be free, and if she wanted to leave, then he should let her do it. And she said that she believed that he would make her happy. Nine years ago, the Imperial Palace, Second Prince Elvis called Bruxamillion, and he tells him that it's time to return home, otherwise his mother Elizabeth will worry. Bruxamillion replied to the prince that he need not worry, because he was already 15 years old and was no longer a child. Elvis laughed and said that no matter how old he gets, he will still remain a child to his parents. The second prince then asked him if he remembered what he told him. They would see each other again next week. Little Brooks got up from the table and told him, Okay, he will wait for him here until next week he shouted and ran away. Your Highness the second prince, are you okay? The maid asked Elvis. He asked her what she was talking about. The maid said that this child was unclean and should not be near him. The second prince got angry and told her not to say that Brooks already has to constantly hide from everyone, which is why he has no friends, and it is not his fault that he was born an illegitimate child. He asked the maid that if he also treated him badly, then who would even communicate with him? But your highness, her majesty will be upset if she finds out about this, the maid said with concern. Elvis said that it's true. Mom can't stand the fact that there is an illegitimate son. Because of this, I feel sorry for him even more, and he doesn't know how long these two can live. Little Brooks returned home and greeted his mother, who was sitting on the sofa doing embroidery. She turned to him and told him to come closer to her. He asked her not to talk to him like a child. His mother replied that she remembered that her prince was already 15, and the maid standing near her mother began to giggle. Elizabeth hugged her son and said that this child had grown into such a handsome prince and she was very proud of him, Brooks said to his mother, and she interrupted him and said in a whisper that a little more, and he would soon become an emperor. Then she showed what she was sitting and embroidering and told him, Look, I embroidered a coat of arms for your future robe, which you will wear at the coronation. She explained that this was the imperial coat of arms and could only be worn by the imperial family. If he becomes the emperor, then she can also wear it officially, and then no one will dare to touch her. Then she looked carefully at her son and told him that he should become the emperor, not the father, but he would protect her. Do you understand me? Elizabeth asked Bruxamillion, and he just answered mom and looked into her eyes. Everyone knows that Elizabeth is just a mistress, and her son is an illegitimate child, so he did not inherit the Solaris surname. The maids giggled, and one of them said that an illegitimate child could never become an emperor, and the second added that that was why the emperor never visited them. How long will it take little Brooks, he thought, and clenched his fist. Every day his mother's illness progresses, and he can't do anything about it. All he can do is hide from everyone and calm down his beloved mother. What are you talking about? Why should I join Bruxamillion to commit a rebellion? What is the point of me doing this? Second Prince Elvis shouted. And he added that Little Brooks was not plotting any treason, and asked the First Prince Travis from whom he heard this. The First Prince sat in a chair and, smiling sarcastically at him, asked if he really thought there was no point in doing this. He was not sure. And he told Elvis that he is the Second Prince, and by right he follows Travis to the throne. Even his mother supports him. So he has no chance of becoming Emperor. 
Elvis was dumbfounded and Travis continued, saying that this is why Elvis decided to entice a naive and obedient child to sit on the throne and rule it in secret from everyone, everything is quite logical. The second prince shouted that this was nonsense. He didn't do anything like that, but Travis told him that many people had already seen him spending time with this boy, and he said that's why with these witnesses and what he told his father, he thought that his father would believe him and not Elvis. The second prince did not know how to respond to this, and then the first prince told him that if he gave up the right to inherit the throne, he would keep his mouth shut, thereby saving his life. Elvis asked about the right to inheritance, stuttering, and Travis told him that he told him not to communicate with that illegitimate child, but he saw him in secret from his mother and now let him see how everything turned out. Your unnecessary sympathy has trampled your bright future. If you want to be offended, then be offended as much as you like, said the first prince. And he added that if it weren't for this child, the second prince wouldn't have to go through all this now. Little Brooks sat at the table in the garden and had breakfast all alone. He looked at the empty chair and wondered why Elvis didn't come. Maybe something had happened to him. Maybe he was busy with work, so he couldn't come. Yes, most likely that's the case, he thought. After some time, Bruximilian conjured a portal and immediately found himself in the Emperor's mansion. He stood and wondered where the second Prince Elvis was now, maybe in his office. Elvis sat at his desk in his office and recalled the words of the first prince, how he said that if he renounced the right to inherit the throne, he would keep his mouth shut. And he also told him that Elvis's unnecessary sympathy trampled on his own bright future, and if he wants to be offended, let him be offended as much as he wants. As he sat and thought, suddenly a hand touched him, and when he turned around he saw little Brooks standing behind him. Elvis asked him what he was doing here, and he replied that he snuck in using invisibility magic, something he had previously trained in. The second prince looked at him and thought that it means he knows how to use such magic, and Bruxamillion told him that he did not come at the promised time, so he himself decided to come to him. Then he said that if he is busy, then maybe he can help him. If it is paperwork, he can be useful to him. But suddenly, to the great surprise of little Brooks, Elvis suddenly stood up and told him to leave and not come to him again. Bruximilian asked what happened, and the second prince yelled at him that he didn't want to see him anymore. Brother, what has come over you? What have I done wrong? If I did something wrong, let me correct it, the boy said. And then Elvis told him yes, he was at fault, that's right. It was his fault for sympathizing with someone like Bruximilian. He continued to shout at him and said that it was Little Brook's fault that he was born. And the second prince ruined his life by getting entangled with him. His existence is a sin in itself. Tears welled up in the boy's eyes, and he told him, Brother Elvis, what are you saying? And he answered him so that he should not pretend that he did not understand anything. It was all because of his mother, Elizabeth. Then he added that he was aware that she wanted to make her son emperor. Little Brooks replied that it was not like that at all. His mother had a mental illness, and she wasn't serious about it. But Elvis said that she really said that. Did he think that anyone would believe that the mistress who seduced the emperor and gave birth to an illegitimate child would not want to take over the throne? And he continued to say with anger that Helga and Bronson know about the nonsense that his mother is talking about, and there are also witnesses among the palace servants. Bruximilian listened to all this with tears in his eyes, but Elvis still did not let up and told him that now the boys blame him for treason, and in order to avoid reprisals, he must give up the right to sit on the throne, and all this is because of him. The boy began to cry and said that he was not plotting treason. He had no such thoughts. It was enough for him that he and his mother could live in peace. I wanted a quiet life, so I deliberately hid my magical abilities, said Little Brooks. And Elvis opened the doors and was about to leave, but suddenly told him that if he really wanted this, then he needed to shut his mother's mouth. And at the end, he added that sooner or later he and his mother would be killed, so let him return back and accept his fate. Bruximilian was left alone and could not believe what had just happened, what his brother, the second prince, said. He thought that maybe this was all a nightmare. After all, he and Elvis immediately became friends at the first meeting. He always thought so. Count Engels was sitting in his mansion in his office and drinking wine, waiting for the guest. When she came in, he said welcome to her with a smile. The imperial servant Meryl Vamp came to him. She asked the Count for what issue he called her. He told her that he had been waiting for her and was glad that she'd finally come to him. Meryl said he knew how busy she was and hoped he understood how hard it was for her to get here. 
The Count apologized and said that he called her because he had good news. She asked him what other good news. He said that the Emperor was hiding a mistress, and on top of everything else, he had an illegitimate child. Meryl was dumbfounded and asked if the Emperor really had a mistress and a child. Count Engels asked if anyone knew his mistress. This is Elizabeth Green. This is the one who Meryl Vamp hated so much while studying at the Academy. She said, wow, and added that this is very unexpected news. If the Count already knows about it, then it's not a secret. He hugged her and said yes. The Emperor tried to hide it for a long time, but the Empress herself will soon know about it. And now Elizabeth's quiet days are over, and she thinks that her child will also die soon. Then he added that, to be honest, he was a little sorry because Meryl herself knew how the Count desired Elizabeth while studying at the Academy. Therefore, if she is going to die soon anyway, then maybe I should take Elizabeth and have fun with her a little before that, the Count asked Meryl Vamp. She told him that he was crazy, this is the Emperor's woman. If they find out about this, he will be killed immediately. The Count said that the fact that she was the Emperor's woman excites him even more she is charming because she managed to bewitch the Emperor himself. Then, with a smile, he said that he already had a prepared woman with red hair, they just needed to be swapped, and he didn't care about the child. Meryl Vamp drank wine and thought to herself what kind of strange things the Count was saying. He turned to her and asked if she didn't want to see how Elizabeth was sliding to the very bottom. And he reminded her that she never managed to defeat her at the Academy. Doesn't that make her angry? She looked at him silently, and the Count said that of course she would get something for this, after the end of this matter, he would give her 70,000 gold, and she would live under a different name, like you, he asked her. Meryl thought for a while and replied, Okay, I agree. Little Brooks walked home and remembered Elvis's words that they wanted to execute him and his mother. He had to do something. He had to protect his mother. Must protect her from the Empress, and he is the only one who can do this. No one dares to threaten his mother. The Empress and the First Prince are a threat to her. They want to harm her. Brooks will protect his mother, and for this he will have to kill these two. The Empress and the First Prince were drinking tea and suddenly began to choke. The maids were very afraid for them and began to shout, Your Majesty the Empress and Your Highness the Prince. A child born on the night of the Witch Moon gains strong mana. Most children die unable to control this power, but little Brooks survived. And as he grew older, he began to use magic on his own without studying it. Ancient people ignorant of magic called children born on the night of the witch moon demons. Then it turns out, thought Little Brooks, that he is a demon. He approached the Empress and the Prince lying on the floor and wondered if they were dead, because he didn't even have time to think that he wanted to kill them. Did he really do it? Suddenly, a servant fell to the ground next to him in fright and said to Prince Bruximilian, What are you doing here? The boy looked at her and thought, It turns out she sees him. The magic of invisibility ended, and he asked her if she knew him. She covered her mouth with her hands and thought, damn it, why did I say that? He came closer to her and said, You are the one I saw several times in the palace, and you Meryl Vamp studied with your mother at the academy. Little Brooks looked at her and said that if she knew him, then nothing could be done. Meryl knelt down and began to beg the boy not to kill her. She would not tell anyone that she saw him today. Then she raised her head and said that she would not tell anyone anything until her death and hoped that he would change his mind because she knew Elizabeth. Brooks hugged her and said okay, but she shouldn't tell anyone. Nothing of what was happening should leak out. It's clear to you that he asked Meryl. She answered okay. I won't tell anyone and ran away. The boy was left alone and thought it was good that it happened so. He didn't have to kill anyone else. The second prince sat in his office, leaning back on his chair, and thought that the Empress and her elder brother had unexpectedly died. What happened? He wondered. Who killed? Maybe one of the nobles, although they are not strong enough to pull off such a thing. Either way, his brother is gone, he told himself. Then Little Brook suddenly appeared and with a smile asked Elvis if he liked his gift. He looked at the boy with surprise, and he asked him why he was here. He seemed to have a lot of work. The second prince was furious and shouted at him why he had come here again and what gift he was talking about. Then it dawned on him and he asked Brooks if it was he who killed the empress and brother. The boy clapped his hands and said with a smile that, as expected, he was very quick-witted and told him that everything was right. It was all his doing. And he admitted that it turns out that he can use not only the magic of invisibility. And what will you do next? Kill me, the second prince Elvis asked him. 
Bruximilian answered him that he should not thank him, because he wanted to put him on the throne. The second prince asked him how to get to the throne. But the boy just smiled at him and told his brother not to forget that he had helped him, and he added that he would make Elvis emperor. But if he forgets about this, his heart will immediately stop. Bruximilian walked and thought about the words he said to his brother that there was no turning back. But what should I do next? I'll think about it later. So much has happened today, he told himself. And he said that he was too tired. He wanted to meet his mother as soon as possible, and he wanted to relax in her arms. The boy entered his mother's room and called her, then asked why her lights were off and where all the servants were. He couldn't understand what was happening. It smelled like mint. He wondered if it was mint tea. It's strange that mom doesn't usually drink mint tea. Little Brooks came closer to the chair and saw his mother's hand sticking out under the sheet on the floor. Mom, what's wrong with you? You spilled all the tea. Wake up, Mom. You are the mother of the future emperor, the boy said. He began to cry and say that she couldn't lie on the floor like that. It's dishonorable, Mom. Bruximilian began to tell her that he had such a hard day today and he got hurt to protect her. He did something he didn't want to do. He sat on his knees in front of her and said that was why he wanted to see her so much. Therefore, he said and began to cry even more and began to say, hug me. Mom, please, Mom. The boy lay down on the floor next to his mother and began to whine and call for his mother. Suddenly, Count Engels came into the room and said, Damn, this is not what we agreed on. Why did everything go the other way? Why is the child alive instead of Elizabeth? He stood and cursed and said, Idiot, what have you done? Little Brooks lay and thought who this man is. He doesn't know him, he just wants to rest. The next morning, the boy woke up tied with chains in some kind of cart, looked around and asked where he was. The man who was sitting in front and driving the horse turned to the boy and said, well, he finally woke up. Then he asked that he was probably wondering where he was and said that this was a slave cart. It was Count Engels who sold the boy to him. Little Brooks sat and thought who this Count Engels was, and the man continued and said that he did not know who this boy was, but now he was just a slave. But he doesn't have to worry since he's handsome, he won't do any dirty work. Then the man said with a smile that usually children in slavery die quickly, but such a handsome man like him can last for several years. Or if he likes it himself, he can teach him the secret of survival. Bruximilian looked at his handcuffed hands and thought that he was now a slave. A certain Count Engels found him and sold him. He thought about what would happen next. Then he eliminated these thoughts that it was better not to think about it. He didn't care. His mother died, and he didn't care if he died like this. The man called the boy, but he did not answer anything and lay down, and then he said that the boy was very boring. Little Brooks had already been brought to the market, and a seemingly powerful woman and a man approached them. The woman said with a smile that she would give 100,000 gold for this child. The man who was selling the boy suddenly asked her if she was Chloe Waldorf and told her, okay, take the boy. Then, taking his money and leaving, he told her that he hoped she would like the boy. Chloe looked at Bruximilian and said that she could smell his body and ordered the servant Mason to take and wash the boy, then return him to the meal. Chloe Waldorf was already sitting at the table in the living room and having dinner. The servant came in and told the lady that he had brought the child. She looked at the boy and said that after bathing, he looked so handsome, as expected from her trained eye. Then she ordered Mason to sit him down at the table and asked the boy that he hadn't eaten properly yet, so let him eat first. They served him a huge steak with vegetables. He began to eat and asked what they wanted to do with it. Then he said that if she wanted to use him as a toy for entertainment, then she should know that he could not give her what she wanted so much. Chloe smiled at him, drank wine, and said that he was still so small. Then she said that it looked like she would have to teach him a lot, and she needed to start with his manner of speech. In the end, this woman did not get him into bed. Instead, she taught him arithmetic. She also taught me how to use a sword and magic. Chloe then taught him dancing, etiquette, manners, and also taught him how to interact with people. Bruximilian suddenly asked her why she was teaching him this. Shouldn't she just teach him how to behave in bed? Chloe hit him over the head with her smoking pipe and told him, Hey boy, you think too much of yourself. You're too young to warm my bed. He touched his head where she had hit him and wondered how long she would continue to treat him like a child. Suddenly, Chloe told him that she was joking. She had a reason why she decided to train him. She stood up from her chair and said that she actually knew who he was. He was Prince Bruximilian. The boy said that she was an incredibly smart person, since she was able to recognize the prince in some slave. Then he asked why she brought him here, knowing who he was. It was quite risky. 
Chloe looked at him and said that he's a very greedy child because he wants to get power, strength, and money. But the only thing you don't crave is love, she said, and looked him straight in the eyes. And she added that he just didn't want this, because love always leads to grief, and after these words the boy turned away from her. He began to remember his mother and said, like my mother, who fell in love with the cowardly emperor. Chloe told him to promise her one thing, she would give him the Waldorf, but in return, he must destroy Bronson. Then this child will gain freedom, Chloe said. But Bruximilian did not understand which child he was talking about and asked her if she was accidentally talking about the Bronson family child. She told him not to be so impatient, she would tell him everything slowly. Then, with a smile, she began to tell that this is a very old story. Waldorf gave birth to a girl named Angelina Waldorf. And that's where the story ends, Chloe said and put out her tobacco, then asked him if he promised he would do it. He was a little shocked and said it wasn't easy to believe, but he also didn't think she was lying. Then, after thinking, he shouted, Okay, he promises her that he will do it and added that he hates traitors who go back on their words, so he swears on his soul. But in return, I will get everything the Waldorf family has, Brooksimilian told Chloe. I have to do this to Claire, and I'm not asking you to understand me, he said. Chloe told him to repeat the following words after her, I swear Claire Bronson will be safe. He told himself that he would do this. He would take revenge on everyone who made him this way, and he would no longer live in fear and hide from everyone. Time passed, and after Chloe's death, the hero became the head of the Waldorf family and changed his name to Brooks Lawrence. And thanks to his many exploits, he was called to the Imperial City of Solaris. Brooks had already been to the castle, and looking at the pen, said that it was difficult to find such a high-quality item. As expected, high-quality items were used in the Imperial Palace. I really like this. Can you give it to me, Brother Elvis? said the hero. Elvis was shocked. He did not expect to meet him and said to Brooks a million, What are you doing here? Then he said, No, wait, what do you want? Brooks told him, Oh my God, Brother Elvis is all you can say to your little brother you haven't seen in nine years. Then he said with a smile that he had come such a long way to meet him and he must not have recognized him because he changed his name. Elvis asked him if it was he, Brooks Lawrence, who owned the Waldorf. The guy answered correctly, and he was disappointed because he thought that his brother would recognize him right away. Brooks said that in any case he is alive and he is here to meet his brother, it seems that he has not forgotten his words and is very happy about it. And he added that he doesn't need this fountain pen, it looks good but it's garbage garbage whose only beautiful rapper is. Brother Elvis couldn't believe it and said to himself, he's back, Bruxamillion is back. A grand gala ball was held in the great hall of the Imperial Palace. As soon as Brooks Lawrence entered, everyone began to whisper and say, look, the head of the Waldorf family has come. And there was also talk that this time he should receive the title of Archduke. He is very good at entrepreneurship. And they discussed how handsome and capable he is. A man approached him and said, why not cooperate with their family? Their family has a very good piece of land. Brooks didn't listen to him, but just thought how annoying it was. But suddenly he saw a girl with long brown hair and said to himself that this was the Claire Bronson Chloe was talking about. The hero looked at her and thought how these clothes don't suit her. They look shabby. And he heard that she is engaged to Tom Reacher. But why is she wearing such clothes? Brooks began to watch Claire and Tom as he held her hand and said something nervously. The hero grinned and thought that it looked like Tom Reacher didn't want other men to look at her. She's definitely Chloe's relative, he told himself, but in any case he thought, he promised Chloe that he would help her. Brooks felt that he didn't need to get involved in Claire Bronson's business because she liked Tom, so he thought it would be okay since when she got married, she wouldn't have anything to do with the Bronson family. But Claire said to Brooks on the balcony, Please marry me, but don't fall in love with me, and he said okay. It was a marriage of convenience, without love, and they both believed that they did not need love. Then he wanted to give her a new identity with which she could live in peace, and thanks to which she would not be associated with the Bronson and Lawrence families. Brooks thought this would be enough to keep his promise to Chloe, but the hero would really like it to be so. At a time when he should have strengthened his relationship with Reacher, he should have been restrained, but he was so angry that he couldn't stand it and Claire's injuries on top of that. She said that there was nothing wrong with it. But for some reason, every time she hides her pain, Brooks begins to get angry. After all, the heroine looks so sad, but he doesn't want to see her sad face. He wants to protect her smile. The Marquise wondered when he had become so attracted to her and said that he would need to tell Will 
to put aside all matters related to Bronson. The maid told Miss Samantha that Madame had ordered her to only eat a couple of spoons of soup today. Since her fiancé has passed out, she must show that she has no appetite at all because of this. Samantha told the maid, Okay, you can take everything. Then she lay down on the floor and began to wail for how long she had to do this, and also for some man whom she doesn't love at all. After all, she only managed to flirt with him a little, and he immediately fell head over heels in love with her, and even if her mother said to be with him, she still doesn't need such a carefree and heartless man. Samantha sat down and said how she would like to go somewhere far away again and never come back alone, but unfortunately, this will not happen. Suddenly, the nanny came running to her with the words, Miss Samantha, we are in trouble. The girl got scared and asked what happened, had her mother really made a fuss. The nanny said that was not the point, but that it was about postponing her engagement to Reacher. Duke Reacher sat in the garden as usual, tending to his flowers, and asked the servant, Tom went to the Devil's Ridge again. The servant replied that yes, he lost his temper and went there to the mountains. The Duke shook his head with displeasure and said that everyone in the family is adequate, and only he is always doing something strange. He knew Tom wasn't good enough, but he appointed him as his successor based on his sword skills. However, he broke off his engagement to the eldest daughter of the Bronson family, then decided to get engaged to another girl. And then, without saying a word, he ran away to the Devil's Mountain Range. I'm not going to take this anymore, said Duke Reacher. Then he told the servant to tell the Bronson family that they were going to postpone the engagement. Afterwards, the Duke thought that Tom was not capable of holding this title, and he was going to pass the title on to his younger brother, Michael. At this time, Tom found himself on Devil's Mountain, in the middle of a dense forest. Heavy rain was pouring and wolves began to surround him. Damn, they don't end, Reacher said. He told himself that he should return to Claire as soon as possible. She must not know Brooks Lawrence's true intentions. Tom got into a pose to fend off with his sword if one of the wolves attacked him, thinking to himself that if he had known that everything would turn out like this, he would have married her right there. After all, Brooks Lawrence's real goal is to destroy the Bronson family. I won't let him kill Claire, Tom shouted furiously, no matter what the cost, even if he has to sacrifice his knighthood. I will free Claire from Brooks Lawrence's death grip, he said, and swung his sword, then shouted furiously that he would do anything to make her love him again. Claire and Brooks were having a meal, and the hero told her with a smile that he wanted to go on a trip with his wife. The girl was very surprised and asked what kind of trip and where. Brooks replied that a lot has happened lately. They need a change of scenery and go to the suburbs. What do you think? He asked her. She didn't know what to answer at first. Then she said that she didn't know that he had any other wife besides her. And you have such a close relationship that you even went on a trip together, the heroine said. The Marquis laughed and said that now he has only one wife and her name is Claire, and the girl said in surprise that she did not know it was her. The heroine suddenly began to remember how he was married to Samantha in a past life, so she thinks that she is not the only wife. Then she began to think about how interesting he and Samantha were in their marriage. He was also so kind to her. But her thoughts were interrupted by Brooks and called her, and said that she was asking about another wife and asked if there were rumors that I had another woman in the capital. She thought that she had overreacted, so he thought too much of himself, and told him, Yes, I heard rumors that in the capital you saw some beautiful blonde every day. Brooks was surprised and said what kind of rumors were these. This type was clearly not his type. The heroine asked if it wasn't his taste, but what his ideal type was then. I can tell he started and said that his ideal type is a girl with long brown hair. Claire smiled and asked what he meant by her, wasn't it the most typical classic move? Marcus said that, anyway, he took a couple of days off and wanted her to join him, and they would definitely have a good time. Then he told the heroine that if she doesn't like trains, then don't worry, he'll come up with something else, just if he says so. Because your husband is able to do this for you, the hero said. She smiled at him and said, okay, let's go on a trip. When they arrived at the station and the heroine saw the train, she was simply stunned. She asked Brooks if this was his train, and he replied yes, and that the railroad company itself belonged to him, so there would be no one else on the train except them. The Marquis looked at her, then extended his hand and said, Well, let's go. They were driving, and the girl looked out the window and admired the views and said what a beautiful landscape. Brooks replied that he was glad if she liked it. Claire sat down and said that this was actually her first trip. Brooks was surprised by this and asked if it was true, because he had heard 
that the Bronson family went to their own country mansion every year. She answered yes, everyone went except her, she didn't want to disturb their family idol. Because without her they were all very happy, and she never expected anything from them, so she didn't care. But now she realized that traveling turns out to be not so bad. The hero looked at her and said that it was probably because he was with her. The girl laughed and said who knows maybe. Claire admired the Marquis and thought to herself that she should not hope for anything. Her feelings should not change. She knows she shouldn't fall in love with Brooks Lawrence, but suddenly he interrupts her thoughts. The hero touched her cheek, then ran his fingers through her hair and said that he was already looking forward to their journey together. The girl blushed and looked at him shyly and said that she was also looking forward to it, but thought to herself that she could not force her heart to beat so fast. They arrived at a huge waterfall and the heroine gasped in amazement. What a beauty, I'm seeing a waterfall for the first time, Claire said. Brooks replied that he did too. The hero said that when he came out into the world after a reclusive life in the palace, a lot of work appeared. He visited a lot of places while learning how to manage a trading company, but alas, he was not able to visit tourist places. You were in charge of affairs in a trading company, so it turns out that the roots of your wealth grow from there, the girl asked him. Brooks replied that yes, the head of the trading company helped him. She gave him the position of manager. Claire became interested and said that this was obviously a very large company, could she know about it. Brooks wanted to say something else, but suddenly there was a heavy downpour. The hero took the girl by the hand and told her to run after me. The Marquis took her to a cave to wait out the rain and gave the heroine his jacket. After a couple of hours, the sun finally came out and the girl said, Brooks, look, the rain has stopped. They left the cave and Claire said, thank God. Otherwise, she already thought that it would rain for a long time. Let's go, madam, Brooks said, and the girl asked that they were already returning home. He smiled at her and said, no, I will show you something else amazing. By the time they arrived at the place, it was already dark and the hero led the girl to an amazing place where flowers grew in the middle of the lake. Claire opened her mouth in amazement and said, My God, this is what you wanted to show me. Brooks told her that the lake, in which the night sky is reflected, is truly a beautiful picture. The sky cleared up after the rain and became even more beautiful. He turned to the heroine and asked if she would like to dance one dance on the lake. The girl asked in surprise if he really should dance right in the water. He told her no, not in the water. The Marquis extended his hand to the lake, conjured something, and a bright blue glow appeared. Then he took Claire by the hands, pulled her along, and said with a smile that they would dance on the water. The heroine was shocked, looked at her feet, and said, we are really floating over the lake. You did it with the help of magic, the girl asked him. He answered correctly, with magic everything is possible. Afterwards he said that he also prepared the music for the dance, and as soon as he snapped his fingers, wonderful music suddenly began to play. Please, madam, he said to Claire and extended his hand, inviting her to dance. And they began to dance almost all night, hovering over the lake and looking at each other. The next day, they boarded the train again and moved on. Claire and Brooks sat in the compartment, looking out the window, telling each other funny stories. They also visited a large farm, where they looked at horses, deer, bulls, and other animals. On the way, we ate different types of all kinds of delicious dishes and just fooled around. When they arrived home, Brooks handed her photographs taken on the trip. The heroine was met by her maid Mia and thanked her for the fact that her mistress had brought her a gift. I will keep it carefully, Mia said and bowed to her mistress and Claire smiled back at her. Then she told her that she was very refreshed after the trip. It seemed that the trip was a success. The heroine blushed a little and touched her face and asked and the maid asked her where she wanted to go next time. Claire said with a smile that she doesn't even know. She thinks she will like it everywhere because this was her first trip but she is incredibly happy. Mia said that she understood her and would pass it on, but for now let the mistress rest and if she suddenly needs anything, she will call her. The girl thanked the maid and began to look at the photographs from the trip. Then she told herself that she wanted to go on a trip again, but then she blushed and thought, well, I'll give it to you. I just returned from the trip and I'm already thinking about a new one. Suddenly a strong wind blew and she looked towards the window and thought about the interesting time when they managed to open the window. Then she went to the window and thought why only this window was open. Maybe Mia forgot to close it. But suddenly she saw that there was a strange note on the windowsill. The heroine took the note and wondered where it came from. The note said, Brooks Lawrence will destroy the Bronson family. Come alone to the appointed place. The girl was furious and began to think, then looked around. 
I wondered and began to wonder who the hell could have left this note.